Hey, listeners, this is a special episode for me. Kevin Lee Roy's, or Kevin Bakoda, as I always knew him, is a legendary product designer in snowboarding that I've been looking to connect with for years. I'm so excited to bring you this week's episode. Could you please join our Patreon by following the link in our Instagram bio or by looking up F and Rad on Patreon? It really helps me follow my passion and bring you episodes like this one. The F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Skyview Campers, Never Summer's innovative take on the tiny home. Designed and built in beautiful Colorado, check out skyviewcampers.com. Wired Snowboards builds quality snowboards by hand, 10 minutes away from my house. Visit wiredsnowboards.com and order one today. Fixed bindings are easy to adjust, long lasting, high performance bindings built to have less impact on the environment. Check out fixbindingco.com. Rip Curl Outerwear, strength, durability, and performance. Designed to search further in the snow, head to ripcurl.com and check out the anti series jacket. I can't wait to rock this thing. New Greens, 100% organic, vibrant green juice. Buy yourself some at newgreens.com and use code F and RAD at checkout for 20% off. And for a chance to try New Greens for free, listen to the end of the show. The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, best selection, best prices, Vancouver's premier snowboard shop. Go to boardroomshop.com and use code F and RAD10 to save 10% off your next purchase. Support also comes from Mount Seymour, Grouse Mountain, Cypress Mountain, the Pro Standard GoPro Accessories, and our friends at 1910. You can use code F and RAD at checkout for 20% off at 1910.com. The Havens, a center for transformational learning, located on beautiful Gabriola Island. Plan a visit at haven.ca and use code FNRAD at checkout to save 10% of their Come Alive program. Kevin Lee Roy started snowboarding in 1982. He was friends with the Kemper brothers, who would start Kemper snowboards in the early 80s. Kevin got hooked on snowboarding and quickly started innovating, starting Bakoda Design Logic with his idea for locking leashes. By the time he sold Bakoda to North Wave and Drake in 1998, for his asking price by the way, Kevin had signed Devin Walsh, JP, Jeremy, Sansalone, and a couple other top tier pro snowboarders to ride for Bakoda. Plus, he had a catalog of clever tools and accessories that is yet to be replicated by any snowboard accessory company. Kevin's a super interesting inventor, entrepreneur, and snowboarder. I'm so glad he agreed to sit down with me in his RV for this episode. Yeah, born uh, at Toronto General Hospital, 1966. Uh, raised, spent my first 14 years like um, Jane Finch. Uh, area so like a lot of that area was under construction when we were growing up and uh, we would play in the, in the construction sites chain and finch is is famous in toronto as like <laughs> is it still i i don't know now but when when i was a kid or when i was in my 20s like that was like it was like a pretty notorious spot right yeah man like so my brothers were four or five years older than me, so they were in in that that uh, that age age group. And uh, yeah, my middle brother uh, when crack first, like my middle brother, like was lost in that in that lifestyle, and and I was definitely going in that direction. Uh, I was fourteen, <laughs> and uh, it was graduation night at grade nine. And that day, I think that day, I I, I beat up a kid, and uh, it was um, in the police precinct, like un, under arrest for that. My family, the police knew our family by name. Fuck. Um, and uh, I wasn't the worst though of them, but I'm saying I was going in that direction. Yeah. And I remember the cops saying, <laughs> saying to my mom, "It's like, oh, you're moving to Edmonton. Okay, we'll let him go so he can be some other city's problem." fuck dude are you serious yeah and then we moved like two weeks later and the worst thing i did there was i shot a kid uh out of a window uh, after school 
uh, with a Pelican. So right around that same time. And that's my mom. We had, there's three of us. I'm the youngest boy and my mom could only take me. And, uh, she had a job in Edmonton and man, she got me out cause I'm a good guy, but I was doing stuff and my brothers were in jail and in, in group homes. I was in a, I was in a foster home in grave home. I was taken away. From from your mom, yeah. Like so, you had a a loving mom family. No, you, that you just could, my mom, right? Like, yeah, we grew up. My yeah. dad, uh, half Jamaican, half British. Yep. And uh, yeah, you know, I was a, I was a troubled kid, man. And um, so I, I was sent away to a farm, <laughs> <laughs> and they had us like slaves, like not all black kids, just all like, and there was like seven or eight girls, seven or eight like boys. And we had to milk cows. <laughs> they were a dairy farm. That's fucked up. Throw bales of hay. And wow. Man. And I was the only black. I know I was the only black kid in that school, St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I won the spelling bee. Nice, dude. That's sick. With the word honest. They tried to trick me with the silent H. That's sick, dude. <laughs> That's so sick. Yeah. I mean, to me, you were enthusiasm in incarnate like naive like when i look back though i was naive enthusiasm no way dude no <laughs> way like i think you play down the importance of what you were doing at that time because there were a lot of people in the space that were um pioneering right like you're pioneering well and and so yeah on the pioneering front we talked about it earlier, like like Nia, Nia Wilson with with Off the Wall, I, I think was the third snowboard shop in uh, in all of Canada. I think the snowboard shop was first in my sense is Hogtown, uh, second, and then Neil. Uh, Neil's always been a visionary and seen things coming early. I, he might have been sixteen, and maybe him and his friend started, but Neil was the. Uh, passion of that shop and that shop when the can-ams got going what a influence um on snowboarding yeah and i love like the back like the one weekend at swain one weekend <laughs> uh, we wrote Ki kissing bridge was our place though i don't know why we didn't get kissing bridge for the first couple but yeah. um okay so on the pioneering side i feel like so many of us yeah okay i started bakoda but who else, man? Like uh, Mike Bass started Homeless. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think you had Staple come out at that time. Limited come out. Orgy come out. Like to me, it hundreds, boggles my mind. We were fucking yeah. kids, man. Kids, twenty-one, twenty yeah. years old, man. Do you remember Safe Closing? Yeah, Gerard, Gerard and Raphael. <laughs> they did a trip to Sudbury, man, with uh, Lori Glazier yeah. and uh, Joe McAdoo. And for us in the Sudbury scene, that was a huge deal, dude. Like these outside pros were coming to our little local spot. Gerard was filming it. He was making films at the time. Yeah, yeah, It, it yeah, was yeah. so sick, dude. That scene was, it was like a microcosm of the world uh, scene. Ontario it blows me away what came out of Ontario. Yeah. Um, Southern Ontario. And then, I mean, where did we get to ride? We had to go. We were Talisman. It was only Talisman or Kissing Ridge. Uh, we lived in Hamilton. Me, Neil, uh, Vento. There's a, a group of us. And that was it. We, like, and we were so close to Kissing Ridge, we'd go night riding. Is uh, it in the United States? Yeah, yeah, upstate New York. It's in New York. <laughs> and you could cross with your <laughs> library card. Like, <laughs> you could be asleep in the car. I swear to God, if you're asleep coming back, two people asleep in the back seat, immigration would go, IDs, uh, don't wake them. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So loose. <laughs> so so loose. loose. That's amazing. You know? Yeah, so the Can-Ams, let's talk about those. Because they were influential okay, the to the scene there. I mean, I remember seeing Brian Langhorst, but, bro, Dave the, Craig. The story of the Kevin Ams. Young. I'm going to say personally, for me, it goes back to the Kempers. Okay. I can't uh, even believe <laughs> that I'm talking to someone who knows the Kempers. That's incredible. Dave, Dave, yeah, yeah, Mark, uh, I went to Arendelle 
and Mark Kemper was in my class, in my marketing class. I remember because that was the year when Coke came, tried the, that new Coke. New Coke. <laughs> What a nightmare. And Pepsi's best ad was, they just blinked. <laughs> like staring kind of, but, yeah, um, dude, that's epic. Yeah, so Mark, and I remember Mark had like a scooter. And so I have a scooter now, man, yeah, because yeah. I like, still, like I'm a kid in those days. <laughs> I had the Honda Aero 80 and I had one. And um, But uh, yeah, okay, so quickly... Uh, my first introduction to snowboarding was through BMX magazine. Then I moved to Mississauga. The f first time I saw a snowboard was the Burton Performer. They, uh, I read the wood one. Yep. Lee Wallace had one. And I'm like, this guy's the coolest fucking guy in the world, man, because I've only seen the ads. And the ads alone, I don't understand it. It's, it doesn't happen to everyone. You see something and you're like, eh, beach volleyball, eh. You know, right, sure. kite surfing. Eh. <laughs> but when I saw snowboarding, it was like, oh, fuck, I want to do that. And then Lee had a board. And now I'm not, I, okay, I'm a Jane and Finch kid. I was a class clown. Uh, I was failing school up until I went to junior achievement. That was my turnaround, junior achievement. And then I started making the honor roll. I was an entrepreneur because I started and I was a builder. I, right away, I'd want to build. It, it but i didn't know what i was doing and i saw that board and i don't know i still you can i lee i don't know the whole story i'm sorry but i was like and after me and i became friends i'm like and i don't fucking know how to use wood or what i'm like <laughs> somehow we can build this it looks like it's plywood uh glue uh how do we bend it uh i don't know steam let's steam it and we steam these sheets and then the fucking house smelled like contact cement and we'd be up all night and then uh, we'd get it together and then we would cut out a shape. <sighs> Fuck, I love these days. And uh, sometimes we'd try and paint them before the sun came up and then we'd get in our car and we'd have two of them and we would drive up uh, towards Barrie to the first like hills that we could find and then we would <laughs> get out and we just used uh, a rubber uh, like for bindings like yeah we didn't even think about it. the heel we got was, there yeah. with a belt we used to cut our belts and then <laughs> like okay now this is before high backs man like yeah and um and we went to the store to buy uh angle iron uh, for fins aluminum to cut yeah to make fins <laughs> unbelievable and then we tried to make bindings we bought plexiglass and uh tried to cut that shit but it it burnt, it melted in the <laughs> jigsaw, yeah. and, but we bent it. So I was 16. I don't even, I can't explain it, bro. I cannot yeah. explain So 16, that's why. 1982. And that's when yeah. I'm in school with yeah. Mark Kemper. And that's when Dave Kemper is also making boards in his basement. And uh, so as the season went on, like we'd meet at nights at, uh, the Mississauga golf course. <laughs> nice. uh, and uh, I mean, and, and Camper's boards, if I remember, his first boards were fucking slick. They're the slick. The graphics were exactly like the Burton Performer, same color, but instead of Burton, it's like Camper. Yeah. Yeah. They were, I mean, and, those are highly collectible boards. Does highly, he still, highly like, collectible. So there's some of those still out there? Oh, like so few. So few. But uh, like. That's got to be 82. Yep. 83. Yeah. And so Kemper, I think he had a better way to make boards. Like, so I actually tried, we made a company called Snowline. And Snowline. My, my brother, Epic. yeah, the Mount Epic. 140, the Mount 150. My brother's painting the uh, the graphics on them. And Kemper was making boards, though. Yeah. We, we were trying to make a mold. And I think that's around the time he went to meet with Jamie yeah. and Lance. Yeah. And that fucking then he comes out with a with a ski that was insane <laughs> right that was I'm so like, what early. just happened here yeah, that was so early yeah. so you witnessed the plywood to ski construction year yes and what happens it's got to blow your mind you just... no because i was riding a barfoot and i fucking love that oh, board man oh wow the flex in that board yeah where uh, did that come from 
That was, uh, oh, where did that come from? <laughs> Ken Achenbach in the nice. snowboard shop. Nice. Because me and Lee Wallace, we couldn't make boards, but maybe we could sell them. And, okay, my memory is a little fuzzy here. Sure. But I'm pretty sure, like, we ordered six boards, or four or six boards, and sent the money to the snowboard shop. Because in the magazine, that's the only place yep. you could buy snowboards. And weeks and weeks and weeks went by, and and we're kids, man. We don't know how to like play lawyer talk shit, you know. <laughs> but uh, finally, Lee's dad got involved and got on the phone and uh, went lawyer <laughs> on them. And uh, I, you know what I wanted though, and I'm I'm embarrassed to say this, <laughs> fucking in that t at the first time when we got the six boards, the one I because we wanted to sell them, yep. the one I wanted was a hooger booger. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, fuck it. Yeah. But uh, so when it, all the dust settled, I had a bar foot with that claw and the, claws uh, of law. I got the neon orange. Yep. And uh, sick man, I could like my nose and tail rise all the way down, down the mountain. Yeah. So this is pre lifts anywhere. You're you're not riding any lifts. On oh, those this things is yet. pre lifts. Yeah. yeah. So man, good questions. Um, and so we we'll get back to the Can Ams and how Kemper. Because it had to do with a story Mark Kemper told me about dirt biking, but wow, um, this was pre lift so the only place we could ride was in Quebec. So we'd make <laughs> trips to uh, we, to Mount Tremblant, uh, which fully could let us ride. But Whoa. our first time, Morin Heights, is on the way up to Tremblant, and um, <clears throat> we just saw a fucking ski hill right off the road, like that big. So me, Neil. Uh, Chetty, I forget who was in that crew, but I'm telling you, Neil's OG, man. Um, we said, let's, let's snowboard here. And we get there and they're like, what is that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, sorry. Man. But yeah, they're like, y you can't write that, that here, but th there's a, okay. If you do, you have to pass a test. Now we only have wood boards with metal fins, man. And this is hard pack. And we've never ridden in hard pack because we've just been trying to find powder on hills. Yeah. They're like, climb up to that tree and then, <clears throat> and ride down and that'll be your <laughs> test. Fucking me and Chetty, as soon as we went straight, our board just pinned straight. I couldn't turn it. I ended up going ass over tea kettle. Fail, Chetty, fail. <laughs> And they're like, okay, you can rent skis and uh, and you can keep going. We're like, fuck that, man. Chetty and I sat and drank like Baileys and coffee. Uh, yeah. And but after that, it was Tremblant, yeah. which still was ice. Yeah. Um, man, I don't remember when Ontario started to open up. So, but you, I bet you yeah. Talisman was one of the first. So you guys rode chairlifts with fins. Like, what was going on? Like, were you able to get down the hill, or was it just a nightmare? It was a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so you're always, like, look, and plus also, to the corduroy, like, uh, no, um, no. And that's why I I think in those days, Ontario snowboarders, uh, if you're from the east, man, like, that's the shit you had to, you had to land that. There's This isn't, like, butt check, like... A butt, you know what a butt jack would do to you? <laughs> yes. You know, your, your head snapping back, like, fuck. Um, no, you had to land your shit. So, so much respect. And, and I, man. So, just the can ask how they started. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mark would tell me about him. He was a, a motocross racer. Mark Kemper. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he told me about an event, that there was a can am event that we found there. And uh, Neil and I were roommates in those days, like later, and we were just out drinking one night. He had two stores, one in Hamilton and uh, the original in Oakville. And uh, anyway, man, I don't know if Neil will agree with this, man, but it was over those drinks that that conversation came up. And I'm like, oh, the can of hands. And, um, and then after that, I mean, I don't know now, but who came through the can of hands? De Coker, you mentioned De Coker. There was De Coker. who was uh, the Moro <clears throat> rider that he just dominated the year that I was there. Trevor came through, like, uh, like yeah. Trevor, uh, Kale, Kale, Kevin, was, yeah. Uh, Kevin was the year that I was there. Darren Robinson's who I'm thinking oh, of. Oh, he yeah, was yeah, ripping. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy Corvese, yeah, like uh, Craig, 
Dave Wright. Yeah. Uh, you know, rest in peace, Jimmy, and Vince Jorgensen. Vince, too, yeah. yeah. Um, because a lot of them, see, this is the thing. Once you come out west, once you realize that you can land and you don't have to always stick it. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to go back. You couldn't go back. You couldn't go back. Yeah. And, but the skills you learned from there, then you're slaying it. I think also there's a hunger right because you're you're adventuring you're you're going out there you're finding spots to do this and then you get here and you're like oh i could do this forever i don't have to go anywhere else this is like and even when they close the lifts i can keep oh totally i can keep going yeah oh my god 100 percent. and people that come out from ontario at first i remember this in the 90s being like did you see that did you see that like they were so excited about things that now would not be that big of a deal but yeah they were so huge in comparison everything was big yeah how long if you were to point it huh. down the hill from talisman and when i got to whistler the first time um ricardo do you remember, remember, do you remember ricardo uh -uh. From, so he started staple i think he went on to oh wow well, he was part of uh, Limited when yep. Limited got started, yeah, and I yeah. think there was a split there. And, and that's I, that was what started Staple because Lim Limited yeah. was um, and Perry, Perry Gladstone, and yeah. no, and Ricardo. Oh, okay. So but, I must have met him for sure. Yeah, and then he went on to work for uh, the shoe line. I think the Burton did. Um, Gravis, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but um, the Can Ams, yeah. But no, uh, because when a lot of us came west and tried it, and with our center stances and like, you know, drilled out, <laughs> Why? cut down noses. You're cut down. Des you're describing me exactly. I moved out here, cut down boards. You know, um, that was a day when you could buy like the T bolts, like as a. Yep. I I don't know why I never did T bolts. Because they ruined boards. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was it. <laughs> well, by the time you're going with, with real deal stuff, did you do hardware? You did hardware, kids, didn't you? Maybe near the end yeah. uh, with Northwave. But, okay. but it all started after I tried to make boards and stuff. Now I'm living with Neil. It, uh, what a fucking crazy house that was, man. Five of us in there um holes in the stairs like when like and the game we would play because we'd be out for every weekend 3 a.m you come in take your shoes off before you turn on the lights because the game is turn on the light and how many cockroaches can you get unbelievable we were dirty fucking yeah <laughs> That's gnarly. And, that, and, and awesome. probably the first, uh, I literally killed a rat in our kitchen oh, so, wow. when UB40 had the song. Um, but um, so my first idea definitely came, we were snowboarding Kissing Ridge one night. And again, I'm not an inventor. I, so I'm not entrepreneurial or whatever. That's why I, like, I wonder how much shit is genetic. But I wanted some hot chocolate. It's cold and icy. And um, I put my board up. And I don't know if someone said something about, oh, watch out, get your board stolen or something. I don't know. But I just, in my head, I just imagine someone walking by and just keep walking like they didn't even stop. But now their board's under their arm. My board's under their arm. Um, so I'm like, oh, I'm just going to clip my leash. You know, the little webbing leash you get. I'm just, which, I got to say, fuck the leash, man. Fuck that. <laughs> like, we were forced... We were mad about the leashes. We all for were. a very long time. And you know yeah. what? Like I made a shoelace leash one yeah, time. To yeah. Just be like, this is all you really need. This is it. But I uh, remember the little shoelace <laughs> leashes. Yeah. yeah. That you just clip on your boot. You would come in and you were blowing our mind with that shit. Sorry, <laughs> we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but well, so yeah. that was the day. That was it, that was literally the click. And in my head, I'm like, you try and walk away with this, it's gonna jerk out of your arm. Yeah. That's it. I won the game. You're not gonna steal my board. Yeah. That was, oh, a locking leash. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and then I went to my brother, Mark, and <laughs> fucking guy. You know, 
he's from the hood, man. And I'm telling my idea and showing him, and, and he went and made one. And you know what he did? He went and stole, he cut a seatbelt out of a car because we didn't know where to get weapons. <laughs> <laughs> That's so dope. That's amazing. <laughs> we didn't know about Fabric Land, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's a quote. <laughs> we didn't know about Fabric Land. Yeah. Um, that's that's <laughs> pretty badass. He got in their car. That's how we made so there's and, no more seatbelt. And and actually, oh my god, this is fucking great. I remember this. The the off the the Can Am, it's the US first. It's it was actually America. Yep. It was the us us can, the Am can or something. Am can. <laughs> but it was America. But I remember taking my first leashes down there and they were out of these like stolen seatbelts. <laughs> Then he did discover Fabric Land and bought uh, Lycra, neon orange. And you remember the chartreuse and uh, chartreuse and uh, and the pink, and sewed them around. And we had you before. Oh shit, man! Before Bakoda, I showed up down there to give away. Imagine this big band of neon pink around your pant leg, and the branding that I had at the time said Puppy B. <laughs> And I made stickers. Puppy B. The puppy be good, the puppy be bad, or the puppy just be. I love <laughs> it. Oh my God, that's amazing. And, and now I think about it, fuck. And then we changed to Bakoda. And that fucking, that's like a prototype name. You know, yeah. When you're a prototype. Engineer. Yeah, dude. Yeah. How did you come up with Bakoda? Where did it come from? Uh, my recollection. So at that point, you know, I said the fire of any venture usually burns in one heart. And so I have two older brothers uh, that my middle brother, Mark was the guy I went to and we started making shit. My older brother, I just have this, and actually there's a picture on my fridge where he lived. I just had this memory of him coming down the stairs with a book saying, you know, there's a tribe in Africa named the Dakota tribe. No way. No way. And it just, it sounded so good. It does. It's oh, so dope. man, dumb. we made up our own legend, too, of the Bakoda, the Bakoda warrior. And, like, you couldn't fucking defeat a Bakoda warrior, kick your fucking ass. But a Bakoda warrior could never be offensive. Only defensive. Oh, wow. And, and I still believe that to this day, That's man. That's a Bruce Lee thing there. That means you just hold your line. All's good, all's good. But you come near me, and I'll defend the fuck out of you. Yep um that was and we had that on our first hang tags and we would tie like a hemp string around every leash with that on there i love that yeah somebody's got to find these we gotta we need to find an intact bakoda first gen that was made in leash. santa barbara not the locking leash it our big breakthrough yep. was the coil leash. the coil leash so we did yep. four leashes when we came out yeah we did the locking was expensive yeah coil leash straight leash and then the webbing leash yeah uh because that the basic um but the coil leash was what made bakoda yeah that's what brought jake burton uh to it to uh, to our booth at the asr wow in our second year yeah second year asr jake burton's at the booth what's he say um he was you know he would peruse the show at, or this is still early but um you know what i gotta admit i, I was not at the booth at the time <laughs> i was told later <laughs> no way <laughs> yeah so you guys Bro, were i'm sorry yeah this is our first year in business yeah this is our first year our first asr we did in new jersey uh, Atlantic, there was an ASR in New Jersey. Atlantic City. Yeah. And then the West Coast one. Yeah. And, oh, God, I don't know if you want to hear the story of how... Let's hear it. I had to get into America to start Bakoda. I was bounced off the border four times. The first time with guns. Um oh, The third wow. time we should have taken our car. Um, but I, So Bakoda, our first year of manufacturing was in Santa Barbara. But to get from Jane and Finch to Santa Barbara was a fucking ordeal and uh along the way there was the asr show and then jake but saw it, the, the the coil leash and um after our first year in business we were terrible at business february march i come back home and i just get a job that's right this had to be in the first year because i just got a job at kimberly clark in the mail room and i was stoked i was wearing button-up fucking shirts i got to 
comb out my afro. I got paid every two weeks. Yeah. That's ridiculous, man. As an <laughs> entrepreneur, that's a ridiculous fucking concept, getting paid regularly. And uh, I come home after work one night and the phone rings and it's Burton. Not Jake, but the company. Yeah. And they want to order 5,000 coil leashes. Yes. It, you know what? If there's, you know, if there's like a, yeah, we did well. Like we got through the season, like fucking Road Tahoe, Donna Ski Ranch. Sick. Um, again, sold to all those shops, Jose, uh, like SMP. We, every single shop carried Bakota. I, like I would drive up San Francisco, hit every shop, and then like Sacramento and Tahoe, uh, out of Santa Barbara. And um, after the year, though, we had no money, and I didn't know how I was even going to get home. I actually had to take a job painting uh, um, a motel, and the owner was part of a cult, but it sounded, I didn't know, the, like, he didn't describe, he didn't say, hey, I'm part of a cult. He just right. said, hey, doing some stuff this weekend, you want to join? And... Uh, then we're sitting there chanting like, and then, and then, and then I, when I got home on 2020 was a thing at top 10 most dangerous cults in America. That one was number three. Whoa. I got out of there Whoa. just in time on that one. Whoa. Plus, oh shit, man. There's too many stories here. The, these guys amazing. were Coke dealers. We thought they were, they made surf leashes. That's why we sent them our money. We get there. They're Coke dealer surfers had two Mexicans working out of the garage Every now and then they made surf leashes. I thought they were, we sent deposits to them to make our leashes. <laughs> Me and my brother show up after I got bounced off the border four times. I finally make it there. And that's what we find out. There's eight people living in this house. One guy's bed is on the pool table. The other one's under the pool table. One guy's on the couch. These guys were at a level. They'd go meet the airplane that dropped by. Like, oh, I didn't shit. know. Wow. Like, I'm like, yeah, okay, we still got to get our leashes made, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was year one. And that was the year two when Burton came out with that. Um, we got the patent on the snowboard thing. Oh, wow. That was a bad year. And for I them. think Sims, I knew Barfoot a little bit. Yeah. Never yeah. met Tom, but uh, like, I've met Chuck. You'd always fucking see Chuck's van at the side of the highway when you're going back. He's always surfing That's <laughs> instead so of sick. working. That's so <laughs> sick. I love that. But um, that was the first year of Bakota out of that house. But when you say I went into shops, I drove up all down Southern Cal. That's amazing. Oh, what are the stores, man? Fucking yeah. green. Uh, like all the OG stores. Like I, I forget. Wave them, Rave and stuff was. Oh, Wave Rave. Yeah. Oh, man. Wave Rave owned Frantics. Uh, leashes, by the way. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Brett Conrad uh, took that over. So yeah, there's so and there then were... we made frantic re leashes. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> we that's made amazing. Burton leashes, frantic leashes, ride, Moro. I had a factory, bro. When I was 25, we were like I had 30 employees. Like we were making shit for everybody. Making leashes. Well, at the whole programs. But at that time, we were doing yep. screwdriver stump pads, and then also we made our own displays. Oh, the, I, you just opened up a whole other can of worms because that was what did it for Bakoda was those displays. Yeah. How dog. could you? Because we would order a couple of tools, right? We'd order, yeah, give us five of these, 10 of these, whatever. But then when the displays came out, it was like, well, it came as a complete, it needed to be fuller. It looked stupid, man. Like once they were, once you were out of a thing, it was like, we need to get you know more where of those I got things. that from Keep It Full was uh, Graham at, um, up at Whistler, what was the big showcase? Show? Showcase, yeah. yeah. That guy, man, he made power walls. Power walls. We made right. our first power display for him. Yeah, it was like, all right, I want, I want the power, but not on the wall. Right. I also wanted people to be able to interact with the pack, the product. Totally. So I made like had ones that had retractable. I forgot all about that. That's uh, insane. You made these displays. We actually made them. There's a picture right there on the fridge of my brother sanding one. That's so sick. Yeah, man. God, um, it was so DIY. But but now the companies you're talking about working with, you're successful. Like those are the big companies in snowboarding, right? You're making these, you're making stuff West for- West Beach, oh. we did a whole program for West Beach, like eight 
and a display like ride also had slim so we did a ride oh, program yeah. a slim program uh burton we did the oh my god i gotta tell you man making burton coil leashes so we bought this machine that just stamped shit because we made a lot of the small stomp pads yeah um so we got our own <laughs> i don't know how i figure this shit out we just like at first we would put it on adhesive and hit fucking like a steel reel die yep. around the stomp pad and like just hammer them out <laughs> then like i got a machine though that boom, boom, and then we could just fucking punch out anything and we made leashes for burton for a few years but man my favorite one had to be the tractor the truck inner tubes I had this idea to get recycled truck inner tubes and we stamped them out in strips and then, and then, uh, took a branding iron with their logo and fucking, oh shit, Paul Clarkson lit on, I'm not kidding you, man. That kid lit on fire <laughs> <laughs> because the branding iron material was made out of magnesium and I, and, and he, I don't know. He's starting to stamp it, and he's like, part of it's touching the rubber. So he takes a grinder, and he grinds it. I didn't know magnesium's flammable. <laughs> and he's grinding, but the dust is hitting his shirt. And then he goes to fucking stamp the next one. And flame, his shirt ignited. We, we hung that shirt up inside. <laughs> Paul Clarkson. That's amazing. That like, so we were branding the Burton logo into the rubber and then sewing. Uh, and again, leashes are lame. We had to do it because of the insurance. Right. That you had to have a retention. I went to 1994, the industry meeting in uh, Montana, Big Sky, Montana. Oh, fuck yeah. That's where I met Sal. Industry meeting. Cool. Sick. Actually, maybe this is a good part to say, point to say you might be the first black snowboarder in canada for sure 82 you're an 82 year 16, snowboarding yeah 16 yeah 66 to 82 yeah is, is yeah that's <laughs> and and i challenge listeners out there there's a lot of people that don't think i'm black though you're, <laughs> you're the whitest black guy i ever met <laughs> oh give me a break yeah. But, but yeah so that's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a pin in that but at the um at the Montana Industry Conference, I sat for an hour with a guy who was Wait, pushing. Is that where Danny Way caught up and went crazy at dinner time? I can't remember. Okay, sorry. Oh, some a lot of shit went down at that one. Yeah, though. a lot of shit went down <laughs> at that one. But there was a a presentation, like a keynote speech, on leash liabilities, and they actually explained why we needed to have leashes. And I didn't know this, and, and nobody probably knows this, but it was for board retention because we didn't have brakes on our boards. If you were at the top of the hill and you were carrying your board, it was supposed to be attached to your wrist. Well, that's what, and this will get to the coil leash, but. Right. Yes. So it was supposed to be attached to you. So if you dropped it, it wouldn't yeah. slide down the hill. But we were always told that we needed to ride it when we were riding the lifts. It wasn't like they were like, where's your leash for riding the this lifts? Is, it, it was a hundred percent from the insurance liability right it was all about uh skiing and and uh retention that's it and the law came into effect because skis before brakes had leashes oh so then brakes uh now correct me if i'm wrong but also at that conference was the guy who invented ski brakes Yes, and there was a, he was doing a releasable binding. He wanted to try and get this whole industry to switch over to, to that. Also, at that yes. conference was, you know, everyone had their different hole patterns, the three-hole pattern, four-hole pattern. That's right. And not only that, I think the Mervyn guys were using Imperial they and everyone were. else. So <clears throat> also was a guy giving a talk on standardization. I uh, went to that talk. Yeah, yeah. I went to that talk. And I, and they, people were like, "Fuck you!" you don't oh yeah, this. <laughs> yeah. People were "fuck you" for sure. The leash guy got it worse. I think the worst guy was the guy who was saying that release bindings were the only way to go. Well, he he invented them. Yeah, and he did well with skiing, but um, yeah, revolutionized skiing. You know, this and man, snowboarding. At least it started. It was culture. It it, it wasn't fact. It it, it was art. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, right? Oh, a hundred percent. It was art, and and you could make your own boards. You can modify your own boards. You can modify your bindings. 
Um, you could do what on that board? You could, um, it, yeah, it was culture. It was culture. And skiing, there are sports that are culture and sports that aren't. Like when you see a skier walking down the street, you can't fucking tell. You see a snowboarder walking mm. down the street, you could tell. Um, that, that to me was a big difference. And because those sports that have no culture, I feel too, no culture, no persona, no personality, no pro riders. So skate, surf, see mountain biking didn't have that. It, right. it, it, it got that eventually through BMX, yep. the influence of BMX, yeah. but, uh, we were culture. So you didn't have, man, I sat on an airplane one time, uh, going to ISPO in Munich, like to, like to Austria and this Austrian, it turns out the guy is on the national ski team and he's been on the team off and on a couple of times, but he's so pissed off at fucking snowboarders. Oh, why? He was pissed. Why? He's like, you know how hard it is to be, every kid in Austria wants to be on the ski team. Do you know what you got to do to make the team? I've been bounced off and on. It's like, you know how many months you got to work it? And you guys are out there fucking drinking <laughs> and then filming and you're making more money than me? Yeah. Come on. No, he was pissed. <laughs> of course. That's awesome. That's but awesome. again, because this was about culture and lifestyle and uh, yeah. I mean, we're bouncing, we're bouncing around a lot, but I think that, that was something, man. What fucking kid ever woke up and thought I, I might make my own pair of skis? Like, let me try and make a ski. Yeah. But right. man, Todd to Coker, when he's 14, 15 in Michigan, like, I don't know if something went out, if aliens sent something out and it's like, <laughs> ding, like all the entrepreneurs in those days, man, it's crazy. And, but yeah, yeah like that, that, that era of snowboarding. And I thank you for recognizing. I don't even know where snowboarding's at anymore. Um, and I, I feel like you recognize, and you know, no, you don't recognize it. You, you know it. You've lived it. And I think for you, this is fun too. <laughs> like, oh my know. god, it's so much fun! Like the it, just seeing you light up on the stories. Like when you're talking about Puppy B, was that what it was? Puppy B? Puppy B. That's just so, puppy because just that's, I mean, that's who you were at that time. You know what I mean? Yeah, like neon it's, pink. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Neon orange and like neon. Uh, okay. So the coil leash, uh, Jake Burton. Five, uh, uh, order for 5,000. Orders for 5,000. And uh, this is like after work. And um so, you know, there's got to be like time to process and this is the season's over now. This is March, April. Now, this is what I found out when their catalog came out though. They had a coil leash in their catalog. So they saw my coil leash at the first show. <laughs> now in the second season, they have a coil leash, but you know what? There were no coil leashes in the world. What there was though, before cell phones was telephones with coils. No now, way. if someone could find that, <laughs> they have a leash in their catalog that has a telephone coil. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is the raddest Easter egg in snowboarding so but far. But they could, couldn't that's find amazing. anyone to make it. Right. And right. I think that's how they landed uh, on me. And I'm like thinking now I'm in the corporate world. I'm going to get out of, the, out of this mailroom department and work my way up to like accounts re receivable clerk or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I get this phone call. And uh, at that point, my brother Mark uh, went back to that way of life. Uh, I think actually when I went to him, he was bruised from uh, pistol whipping, actually. Oh, God. Uh, my brother, Steve and Judy, and like whatever. So it was like me and my girlfriend at the time. I, I met my girl that became my wife. And, uh, and we're like, fuck. Okay, let's do it. Like, it, like I don't even know how we're going to do this, but let's charge him nine dollars. I figure it cost me four fifty to make it. Nine times five is forty five thousand dollars. That's amazing. Let's go, but we don't have any money to make it. And now, I'll say this to any entrepreneur out there, man. Of all the different things, adventures that I've been, I've I've done. There's so many different ways to find financing, and uh, this one way was. Just ask for a deposit, fifty percent, and she laughed, literally laughed on the phone. Like she didn't laugh. It's like it was that the bursting and yeah. then the stopping of a laugh. 
<laughs> she's like, this is Burton. You don't give deposits. Amazing. Amazing. Now, on Dragon's Den, they made me an offer better than, than mine. I should have taken it. Right, right. Uh, but I went back and I, I, I don't know. There's a ground that I go to hold. I think I've learned with myself is I'm not afraid to lose like at all, anything. Like I'm not trying to be anything. So there's nothing you can, so I'm here and I'm like, you can't, okay, well, I guess we can't do it. Then a week later, the call back and $22,500 US. Burton sent you a deposit, a deposit. of twenty two thousand five hundred dollars. That's what started to a Bacoda. kid living in his mom's basement. It's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. So they said no. You said cool. They called you back. Yeah. But you weren't playing was, a game. I wasn't you playing a like, game. Yeah. And that was. But I'd say that that's what launched us because after that yeah. we made leashes for every company in the industry, um, and programs for them and. Uh, but man, I remember making our first batch of a few thousand and uh, me and my girl decided to drive them down to Burlington. Nice. And we rented, uh, we couldn't even afford a proper rental car. The car fucking broke down in Burlington. <laughs> and and uh, we have, it wasn't a car, it was a little uh, van. And we have these boxes of Burton leashes, which by the way, we were rejected at the border because it didn't say where they were made. So then we had to figure out, we had to buy Made in Canada stickers and then open them up, stick those all on, then go to cross again, and uh, we get there, and then we break down the night before in the town, and they're like, well, we're sorry, it's your fault. I'm like, you know what, fuck you, come and get your van then. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. okay, okay, okay. Um, so we somehow <laughs> like get that fixed, and yeah, our first leashes we delivered to Burton for them was in uh, Burlington, Vermont. Or Man Man yeah. No, sorry, Manchester. It was still in Manchester yeah. before they moved to Burlington. That's incredible. No, mm, maybe. Yeah, you because were we've Burlington, also been right, to Burlington yeah, as well. Yeah. No, I don't think we went down to Manchester. That, yeah, that was super early. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, that's incredible. And so then. When when is the first product that's not a leash? What's the first thing? That's a tool. Okay. So the coil leash is what made us because yeah. that's the only leash that made sense. There was a year. There was a year. There was an era of coil leashes because yeah, because you could walk with that. If you drop your board, uh, you're fine. Yeah. But then, uh, but then I'm like, I need to diversify. Um, Why? What was? What's behind that? You're crushing it with leashes. <laughs> yeah we had a lot to do i don't know man it, it, there's a thing in my uh, brain about diversify but like that's a tree on a branch but you don't want to go too crazy with the tree which yeah. we'll get to because cool you know plain saying triple x they got branches that weren't part of their roots you know like uh, i was an accessory guy yeah um so Tools, tools were next. Uh, actually, this is like so, something like that. So, did this exist, and then you just that? Yeah, like as that. But we went on, on to make the Jimmy Driver, which was to put the whistle on there that you could smoke weed out of. <laughs> yeah, um, but you went and you re. So what I did tooled all the inside stuff to make it tighter tolerances was, or something. Well, man, I don't know what. I don't want to bore you with it, but what makes this Pakoda is that I'd go to Taiwan. A ratchet's not a ratchet. That's so we would get them to buy Japanese ratchets. Wow! Like these ratchets are made in Japan. Yeah. And this plastic isn't just plastic. This is polycarbonate. Whereas uh, other companies are going to be using ABS. Polycarbonate is what you use for headlights. Okay. So, and so they have temperature range and impact resistance. Um. So that's the things that would make Bakoda Bakoda. Um, so the tool was next. And then I think was the big road trip because after that was the stomp pad, like the mini ones. Yeah. Now back then was the surf pads from West Beach that had the big ones. Yeah. Astro Turf was, or Astro. Astro Deck. Astro Deck was doing a lot of the early stuff. You and then there was those. some skate, yeah. like just putting skate tape. Yeah. And, uh, I was making these leashes. Now I'm having fun with leashes. So uh, I I didn't like my graphics. One year was a can of uh, of Raid, 
yeah. and we bought we bought bugs and we bought plastic vinyl and we put cockroaches <laughs> we stitched them on with this uh spray can but my favorite one though this got us big in japan was i uh screen print it was called the safety leash and it had a screen print of uh some sperm but we bought uh colored condoms that we opened and stretched up and also stitched under vinyl so you had this condom. <laughs> Fucking man, I forgot that about is that shit. Awesome. That took off. Now the funny thing with that in Japan, though, they got stopped at customs, and maybe it's the name of it was the problem. But you're not allowed to import condoms. It's like it's it's a pharmaceutical. <laughs> oh, no. So they made our distributor cut everyone and take all the condoms out, and then they, <laughs> they went and bought Japanese condoms and put them in. So he's telling me the story, and he's like, "So we did this, we did that, we did that," but you know. It's just not the same. The, <laughs> the condoms aren't the same size. <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. Oh, That's man. amazing. There was the cop killer leash we did, but uh, there's not very many of those. That's amazing. Yeah, the, yeah, the creativity was there. The branding I don't even was know, there. Like the, but you know what? Listen, man, I stayed in my lane. It was accessories. Yep. Um, and the mini stomp pads came from this trip um me my friend chetty and scott oliver who went on to actually manage red the red program oh wow yeah sick yeah uh, he was a rep and then he went to and then uh we were road tripping his kids our biggest road trip ever man in my honda civic <laughs> you know when you're you don't know how how much you could die at any fucking time like we're going through chicago after the, like during the like after the finish of the ice storm, but it's ice and like the vehicles, oh, yeah. yeah. And we're just going back. Oh, look at that idiot! Oh, look at that idiot! <laughs> and then some guy just in front of you, way up ahead, just starts doing this. And they go, oh, "That idiot lost control." <laughs> you're, and you're driving on the same road. <laughs> <laughs> we're idiots. That's amazing that um, you didn't die. That's good. I bet you Scott was driving at, at that time. Um, so we do this big road trip and hit uh, board of Missoula. Missoula, Montana. Yeah. And then we get to, uh, man, we were getting, because we were Bakoda, and I had like 300 leashes. So we'd stop at stores and I'd sell them 20 leashes and then go, hey, here's fucking passes for Big Sky. Sick. You know, here's passes for Red Mountain, man. We rode Red Mountain. Red Mountain, holy <sighs> fuck. Um, because of Spokane, like a shop in, in Spokane. Uh, then we went uh, over to Seattle. And then those guys gave us passes for, because I'd say we're like shooting the Bakota catalog sure. at Stevens Pass. So yeah. we rode Stevens Pass and the best ever, man. And this is where we fucking met the West Coast was Whistler and Ricardo. We got, I pulled that trick at Whistler, shooting the Bakota catalog. <laughs> we, three people, three days fucking free uh, at Whistler. Wow. And our very first run, was the worst experience of my fucking life. I couldn't, as soon as you stand up, you're over. Ricardo's laughing his head off. We didn't know how to ride powder. <laughs> of course. Center stance. So bad on um, those chopped down boards. Yeah. Yeah. I bought that Rome Rogers Powder Sucks ride shirt. For, and non ironically, I wore that. I was like, I hate powder because we went to Baker, cut down oh, boards. Cement. It was just like crazy, and to it, the, and to get out of it, it was, like you know what? I always thought if I fall into a tree well, I just imagine it'd be nice and white, and I'd look around and go, "Okay, which way is up?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the first time I went into one, uh, oh shit, man! My friend Chetty, the Samana Baker, he land, stop, boom, scorpion, slash the back of his head. That kid though, that was before lunch. He's like, "Let's keep riding." <laughs> And then we went for stitches, uh, and then he stole shit. And then I busted my chin open at Whistler. I landed off a drop, and I stopped, and I hit my chin so hard, I I, I ended up down at the the hospital getting stitched up. Um, on that road trip, that's not on that road trip. <laughs> oh man. But, but, but okay, so the oh, oh, so so the yeah. so then I get a phone call from Mistral or something. Yeah, they want to order a few thousand leashes. Yeah, we are now in. Colorado Springs, I think. And I'm like, I got to go back. And, but we're like only weeks in. And uh, I'm like, okay, you guys, Noah Brandon uh, was there. And I think the he's like, well, I got to go back 
to Ver Vermont. Like I think he's a New England kid. He was, yeah. And uh, so I left my car with those guys, and I drove back with Noah. And that it, on that trip, not that I recollect, it, like I just at that time is when I, I'm like, why are stomp pads so fucking big? That's rad. So the very first small stomp pad is the the circle is, with a, uh, yeah, with the a, with the tent. kind of like a roof a house roof on it or yeah. something like a like a like just, two quarter just pipes like a spine i want it to be yeah. like like for yeah. kicking yeah and uh it was made out of polyurethane and chetty uh my roommate and uh through all that he was in drafting in school so he could draw it up sick and uh i don't know how i got it made actually those remember. went off but then they became metal yeah, man. and then the little metal domes. Yeah, dude. I still have some of those somewhere because you can heat them up, take them off, put them on a piece of sticker backing. They're they're you could have those for life. We had different. We had the, like we actually we had a contest. And if, oh, if yeah, you look the in the catalog, too, right? There's yeah. the M track, the K track, and the A track. Yeah, because K is Kevin. It's like yeah. this is my design. Me, my brother Mark, and Al. Because uh, we were like, whose is going to sell best? And no Al, way. Al no came way. up with the uh, like the tiny dots. The the pyramid? Were they pyramids or were they? Mm, I think, no, no. I think he the he, little he little dots. With the little just yeah. dot with, uh, but but with a point, and then then the pyramid. But then I fucking went crazy with stomp pads. In China, I'd see so many manufacturing methods. Um, it, when I started to see micro injection and like uh, what you can do with polyurethane, all the different colors. I started making, I made a ninja, a ninja <laughs> one. I made one that was a beer can. It looked like a beer can that you just crushed. Amazing. And, uh, but it's a Canadian. Uh, I love it. I love it. it. Um, but uh, just stomp pads. Um, the high backpack. Um, that was after the locks, right? So I think the locks were. Oh, you're right. Okay. Sorry. It went tools. Then locks. Tools, locks, stomp pads, high backpack. Yeah. And um and you would No, and then your, wax. And like, wax, like, ooh, we got into right. wax. And then I made an edge sharpener. Yeah. Dude, I got this catalog. The first edge sharpener is literally just a block of wood. Yeah. But I I made an edge sharpener out of uh I made it so it was ninety degrees and eighty eight degrees. Yeah. I used magnets to hold the file in. Oh, so you yeah. didn't have to Oh yeah, and I uh, had a brush on the backside to clean the files that was also held by the same magnets, and I, I had little that. channels inside because you know when you sharpen your edges, the the shavings fall down, and if you keep going over, you you r put the shavings into your board. So totally. You, so I cut a channel in there and the magnet. So now as you're filing, you've got the channel to trap and the magnets to pull. And uh, then you can just and clean it out. I forgot about that. Ninety degrees, eight, uh, eighty-eight degrees. That's that's one def, and that was cast aluminum. See, that's the man. That's I crazy the too. This is why right, I come into right, your store. All right, excited. right, because the edge sharpener, like they've been sharpening edges on skis forever. Like they've had the, the thing. shavings. Yeah, that's yeah. what we use, like the Ku Sport and uh, Swix, Swix Toco, Toco. All these guys have been around for for years. And here and comes that, that, this dude. That aluminum line on your board. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and here comes this dude that solves that little problem and adds the magnets. The magnets, magnets were the, are magic. It was a game changer. Yeah. It was crazy. Well, I, well, bro, when I fell in love with magnets, we, so this tool, we sold a whole bunch. I yep. figured out magnets. After the trade show, Vegas is done. This had a wrench in it as well yep. and, and bits. But... When you open it up, you could drop the bits. It was totally. after the trade show. I realized I could put two magnets in that wrench. Yeah. And I I did it, and that's how I shipped it. We didn't even charge any more. It was just like, that's, that's so a better sick. way for the product. Yeah, yeah. That was the innovation that made Bacota Bacota. Yeah, because I, I didn't yeah. want you to fucking lose a bit in the snow, you know? Right, right. The tool was really important, man, because I don't know what it was with snowboard bindings, but shit just kept coming loose. Oh, and yeah, like, totally. Fucking to have your ankle strap like it, it it almost became a point of which bolt would i like which strap would i rather lose right my toe strap or my heel strap it's true it's and true i i would rather lose my heel strap i was just talking about this I, like, yeah, the, the toe yeah turn, right? <laughs> the toe. I, i'll work out the or sorry the the heel turn like to pull up on the toes yeah i'd rather yeah. lose my heel strap but 
like so I don't, you know they were still figuring out hardware and bindings they were they didn't know about like uh like lock nuts or what i i don't know i just spoke <laughs> with rory carr about this from rc today because he ended up buying bakoda from drake and northwave anyways this is way in the it way way at the end of the story but essentially drake and and, and uh northwave get bakoda and within a few years they can't like they can't make it work because in my opinion the bindings stop coming loose you stop you stop needing a tool kids these days don't buy a tool they don't buy a leash they don't buy a but fucking brand, high backpack once i joined them though then the brand like went into gloves and bags then i was going after the kind that's it that's um it. but before that i just i stayed in my lane you stayed in it, your lane and, and you wax. did it perfect yeah Th like wax. wax we would buy uh wax from germany in bulk and we would melt it and pour it ourselves sick um because we found you know once you go to the ispo show you think toko and swix got it man like austrians and germans and so we'd buy and like because we'd get it so cheap we could do like fluorocarbon waxes um really cheap and and i designed our packaging as such that it was also the mold so you just pour it in the packaging it's perfect and it closes and uh <laughs> Our first wax, oh my god! Our first wax we ever did was called Wax Tarts. Holy fuck, dude! I didn't even. Okay, I'm sorry. That's packaging. I figured out the first wax we did. We literally just bought uh, aluminum, like tarts, like tart <laughs> shells. <laughs> it poured it in, and then we had the we called them wax tarts, and then dropped the label on top and shrink wrapped it. That's what we were making in Stony Creek. That's amazing. In, in Hamilton. That's and, incredible. Uh, that's how we got into wax. And that's also the edge sharpener at that time. And then the mini stomp pad. So, but Bakoda is one thing, but we're, all these other companies love what we were doing. So we're manufacturing for Sims uh, because of our little mini ones. Then we were doing X's uh, for Sims. Plain, oh, fucking Plain Sane. You remember Plain Sane? Of course. Uh, Mikey. Um fucking this was great if anyone has a plane if anyone has a plane saying stomp hat it was a condom with a french tick now i'm talking 3d and with uh spikes all along it oh my god like I, uh, yeah i remember it i remember it that's insane oh shit that's incredible i forgot that <laughs> that that was the character of snowboarding was your accessory stuff like that like you could have a big chain leash oh, if you shit, wanted. Man. Someone did come out. Remember, yeah, yeah. like a giant chain leash, or you could uh, have a barf stomp pad. Someone did a barf stomp. Yeah, pad. yeah, it was nuts. And you had, yeah, it, it's. I like but, uh, that you keep saying you stayed in your lane, right? Like accessories was your big money maker. It was your branding. That's was how I got bought, bro. Yeah, that's how my company got bought. Right. When the Japan Revolution came around, how many brands did we have? Like over two hundred brands. Easy two hundred. Easy. There's like a clothing brand. I like I I know of a few clothing brands that didn't do. I mean, some you know, like Twist and shit. Like, yep, they're knocking it out of the park, like everywhere. But totally. Uh, some they were just really doing their numbers in Japan, and um, I was like, my fucking roommate is it is neil like a shop owner man like i'm a, from snowboard skate shops yeah. and um so i was all about how many relationships you know like uh it's like energy man it's like how many outlets are you plugged into because if one pulls a plug how many are you plugged into now for a lot of people when japan pulled the plug now how many customers you got right you know uh but bakoda I think we were always a snowboard shop brand and RC wasn't. And, um, and in Japan we did well, but that was never like, uh, like yeah. it's the same thing you were talking about with Burton saying, okay, we order 5,000, you go 50% deposit. They go, no, you go, okay. Yeah. And then, but also I could see the industry consolidating and, I, I mean, I'm not a smart guy. It's not like, you know, some things you don't like see and go, hey, I see this coming. You just right. feel it. But like, I, re I just felt the VHS 
store. That's what I felt. Yeah. I was before VHSs, yeah, and then the video store came out, yeah, and fuck, there was everywhere, and they're like a thousand dollar membership, and if you're late two minutes, that's another twenty bucks, and blah blah blah, and then the years go by, they start closing down, consolidation starts happening, and then who was left? So the industry, I just had maybe had an understanding. You saw that. Of some yeah. type of explosion that wasn't sustainable and there'll be a consolidation. And not only that, how dare I fucking try and make a snowboard boot when I'm trying to find the best 3M adhesive for a stomp hat. Right. Like, right. like we had our own freezer. We had, our, we had a boot we filled with cement and we put on a swivel <laughs> to... Because when you get to the bottom of the hill, it's not, it's like, it's, you don't just want to st stand on it. You need to be able to kick this thing, man. Not only that, you, you, you know, when you just snap your board down? Yeah. Yeah. That shock, by the way, those metal stomp pads you're talking about, Pain. the first adhesive was the same for polyurethane. This is where I learned that shit. Then we go to Colorado or to Big Sky and I'm like, hey guys, look at my stomp pad. And I go and I do that and pow, <laughs> it goes off the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, fuck, that didn't stick. <laughs> What's up with that? Then I had to learn more about like closed cell adhesives, open foam uh, cell adhesives. Adhesives they use to hold glass to the side of buildings has to be that strong. Um, and and I test that that shit. So how am I going to make boots? Right, right. Right? How am I going to make a boot fit right? What the fuck do I know about boots? Oh, because Japan wants to order 3,000? Right. Or even snowboards? Because Jamie has blocked off a million boards. If you want any boards from Austria, you got to come through me. And he'd walk around the show going, okay, 10,000 from you, 5,000 from you. <laughs> it's like, I'll do 2,000 boards. Yeah. And now I got a snowboard company. No, bro. I, that's what I mean about staying in my lane. And also, I don't know. I just fucking love you making You loved shit. it. Like, like, it was fun, right? Like, every year there was something that was like a little tweak challenge and then but bringing it, was, it and to it was market. always it was always for the riders <laughs> yeah like like yeah. say this is yeah. just a screwdriver and then jimmy jimmy's in our place when we were in stony creek so jimmy's part of the uh, exodus west um and I, I just remember him like and we're giving him a box of shit and he's like man it'd be so cool if you could smoke weed out of this <laughs> and it it took me like two or three years to figure it out we we were actually trying to drill yeah a yeah. chamber through there i didn't even think about what's all involved to get into here but i'm like if we drill you pack your weed there you so when we finally made the whistle and we made it metal and chrome plated yeah and we put a hole back here so you could pack your weed there and hit it we called the jimmy driver that was the jimmy driver That's after jimmy, jimmy. Driver, yeah. after jimmy but jimmy had already passed away Oh, wow. Well, then it's a tribute, which is even better. It's a tribute to Jimmy. I mean, not better that he passed away, but that's sick. It's terrible. Um, yeah. But I've driven with Jimmy up to Whistler, and if I was going to pass away in a car, that guy loved driving, man. Yeah. But he knew his car, too. Yeah. Um, and I'm a shitty driver. I'm like, you know, from here up to the chief. <laughs> I'm like, Jimmy, I don't know about this, man. He's like, don't worry, man. All his weight in the car. <laughs> I don't know, Jimmy. <laughs> That's a scary drive. I've done Vancouver to Whistler in under an hour. But pre-2010, like it was a shit, windy road. Wait, no, that's, that's an hour and a half drive. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you know, when it's like clean and clear. I, I wasn't driving. Under an hour? It was an, it was an Austrian street bike, like Tour de France style bike racer guy he was like national champ in austria bernie and he had a little honda civic and we were every you, you can trust, corner you can was like jimmy was italian like you can trust europeans like, i i it, we made it there i was drinking i remember i i drank like a six pack on the way up like just mm. thinking I, at one point i think i took my seat belt off i was like i'm so scared I don't know what to do. I'm holding on. I'm gripping. And the, then I just took my seatbelt off and it, was drinking and was like, go. all right, Bernie's got this. So you got to go through, Bernie's man. got the this. The only way to the other side yeah, is fuck through. It. Bernie's got it. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to tell him to slow down. He's and having he doesn't a blast. Die. No. Yeah. And he's, oh, you know, dude, Scott Oliver, psycho. with my car, that's a thing, man. So from Steven's past, we're supposed to follow Ricardo up to Whistler. 
And Scott's like, Kevin, let me drive. I was fucking, I, I'm like, we're falling so far behind. I'm like, I can't see you. It's raining. <laughs> yeah. I'm a slow driver, dude. I'm slow. That's I, when I do on the phone, you know how long it's going to take me to get there? I never make it in the time. Like they have to add a little time because <laughs> like they think uh, I'm gonna drive faster. Normally than I it drive. says uh, yeah. route adjusted. This yeah. yours says the time is <laughs> being adjusted. <laughs> you are slow. I you just know, if I there's don't any go debates the on the concept of yeah. time, it's like <laughs> that's how you play with it. <laughs> All right, tell me about um, uh, tell me about how exciting it was to sell the company to. Uh, like who who reaches oh, out man. from North okay, Wave Drake? So well, wait. Can I tell you about Devin Walsh? Okay, yes, please. Because that's one thing that we've skipped over here completely is that Bakoda was also sponsoring some of the best riders in the world. It was a dope accessory brand to hey, have. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, okay. Uh, we were always, always. The thing is, up until I moved here, I think in 96, from so we built ourselves a pretty good thing in Ontario, and then I remember we bought our first house, this small house. It's the equivalent of say like Surrey, but I remember one day looking out and seeing the last tree get cut down because they could get two more houses in there, and I was broke. I'm like, how did I fucking end up in? How did I end up here? I had uh, my second son was just born. <laughs> I had my Bakota making the dope shit uh, bumper stickers. Um, but I'm like, how did I end up here? And you know that Talking Heads song, you know? I can't yeah. It, but this yeah. ain't my beautiful. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's my? I'm like, Ugh. and we had the house only for a year or so. Again, this is, I don't know why character, bro. Like it's, uh, but it's not, I'm never questing for anything. I'll tell you that. I get stuff and I'm like, hmm. Um, this wasn't my dream. And I looked around at all my neighbors and I'm like, how did this happen? I'm like, Lynn, we got to sell this place. We got to get out of here. And uh, we came out here for a week. We went to Kelowna. I was determined to move to Kelowna. And uh, we get there. And it was so old and so white that uh, I was like, let's check out Vancouver. <laughs> and Vancouver, like that was it. Um, so it, at that time, we still had about 30 employees. But I started to work with Taiwan for the first time. So I'm like, shit, man cheaper it's it, like like i mean in retrospect i guess i was one of those guys right that that laid off people and and went to asia <sighs> but it wasn't just for profit seeking like I, I if i'm making snowboard stuff like the heart is here and i want to be in the soul my brothers moved to where it was affordable i went right into lynn canyon like uh right off kirkstone Enerdale. That's where I showed up, and then, uh, <clears throat> and then start doing my my thing and stuff. And I don't know these guys, but Iris is around. Yep. And uh, I forget how it all happened. Maybe I like just stop in to see those guys. I start meeting. That's where I would meet Dave and uh, and Devin. And Devin thought I was dope, and like you know, I wasn't. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't doing. You know, I'm like, yeah, man, have some shit, have some shit. And these guys are like. Like they're like in the magazines, like crazy. They got these boards, their boots, their bindings. Like I don't know how much he's making. I quarter million, <laughs> but you know what? Didn't have wax. Didn't have a, a binding tool. And at least whatever, but like the basic, it didn't have waxing iron. I'm like, what? Here, man. Like, so that's like our relationship started that way. Um, and, and then I, I think I asked him, I'm like, you know, like the form guys, Kevin Sansalone. Uh, that's but, like, right. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin and Devin. Yeah. I remember when you came into the shop and you said, we've got big news. We just signed Devin Walsh because he was one of the biggest snowboarders in the world. And Bro, you were man, so stoked. Like it. You were that's so stoked. And it was great for the brand. We were stoked. We were like, holy shit, that's legit. Kevin, then then he introduced it to uh, the other guys at Forum. 
JP. He's like, fuck yeah. Bjorn, Jeremy. Wow. And uh, I remember, I'm not dissing this guy at all, man, but like Mike Michael Chuck was a boss, but I remember Devin, he's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because uh, I think Devin was like particular, you know, about like Devin's the most this particular. Is a team. Yeah, yeah. This yep. is a rider. Like, like we all hang out. We don't know this guy. Yeah. Um, Devin. So, Devin was was really. He came from a skateboard background, and he was all style. It's not just that. He was. He he had. Yeah. He to me had a sense of himself as a brand. Mm. Mm -hmm. He had. A, he had a. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like in, but with not like not ego, not ego, but he was curating. He's like not those photos. Yeah. He he was like you, right? Like so, you're talking about the specifics of uh, each and every product you design, and he's telling photographers. If I didn't land the trick, I don't want you submitting that photo to yeah. a magazine. Not not because like, no one else is doing that. Like Rob Dow's not doing that. He's like fucking. If it's a good shot, it's yeah. a good shot. If you caught me here, yeah, and I look good, put it in. Sorry, Rob, but he's told me that I'm the same man. Like half my photos are bales, but Devin took it to that next level. He also would talk with like filmers and photographers. Like only one of you gets to use the shot. I don't want to see the cover shot be the 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 ender of my. Part I mean, what either. fucking vision yeah. is that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like, like, a, like, I don't want to see this type of redundancy. Like, exactly. Th this, you know, this is like we try and learn shit. We like, you know, take this course and learn this, or take yeah. the Devin Walsh course on personal <laughs> branding, at, like branding learning. Yeah, exactly. Fucking no one taught him that shit. No, no. Like the, you know, and 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 some people can get there by learning it and then other people like some it just comes like like it's all from like, here like innately and it and it, you know like i say i just made leashes or i just made salt like listen man i'm not a product any product genius man like it turns out like genetically nature is like make screwdrivers <laughs> you know uh like 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 make little things that people like or, or something but like it's not saying uh, make a power generator or, or something. And um, anyway, like give that guy uh, so much credit. And um, so Northwave, it started there. It started with this relationship. And next thing I know, Devin's fucking inviting me up to the West Beach Classic. And I'm like... You know, uh, what is it, the Longhorn? Yeah. So they got rooms yeah. there. So you're not on your patio watching. You're on the roof of the Longhorn. And, I, and these guys are like, hey, got to go for my run. You know, it's like, that's amazing. I forget who all was there, man. But they're like, got to go for my run. And then this, and then other guys got, and it's like, um, I'm like, man, this is dope. Those are the days. And I remember, um, I, I don't often pick up girls like 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 girls like pick me up, and then they find out I'm a loser. And like <laughs> that happened that night. I remember this girl picking me up. I'm out there with those guys at Cardiac, and some girl like almost by the arm. But like after a while, it how long did it, it took me over an hour to realize I'm now hanging on to her. I'm like fuck man, I'm gonna hang out with Devin. <laughs> like, right, right, like, right, you, bitch. <laughs> um. That's a that's but, a good analogy for for the way you've lived your life, right? People are make make no, make us five thousand. Yes, but part leashes, of it is acknowledging right? how much of a loser I've been at oh, a certain time. Sure, no, sure. for real, because yeah. like I'm not all the time, and then I and plus yeah, then I'm like I'm not. I'm just like you're making me feel like a loser right now. So you know what? Peace out. Um, so those guys, and then and then the X Games were in Colorado Crest no not Crested Butte that was a trans world trans world Crested copper maybe or or Aspen Aspen was X Games I think it's Colorado Springs yeah possibly because I'm not sure man but yeah me and then Devin invites me to drive with him and Derek Catella oh sick what a crew yeah man what a crew and I remember you know uh Devin stops in Bellingham 
because I don't know why he had like, maybe it just came out, but the new Outcast album. Oh wow! Um, but I remember like making a stop in Bellingham to go to the record store. Maybe it was the record store there that he knew about. I'm not sure, but um, so we bounced down there, and that's when I meet. Uh, oh shit, man! We go out for dinner, dude. It's not like I'm starstruck, but I'm just in this, and I'm just now out for dinner. And there's JP, Jeremy, Bjorn, Steve. <laughs> I would be starstruck, Jesus. Yeah, that's crazy. And then it's one of their birthdays, maybe JP. And then a birthday cake comes up with Tina Basich and her boyfriend, which I believe is Dave Grohl. <laughs> yeah, that sounds And about he's right. got the birthday cake. No like, way. Yeah. Come on yeah yeah that's uh, some insanity right there that's crazy that's crazy that that was crazy those guys like to play dice and um mm, i remember the dice years that was who fun. was the smp bro man see i don't know man i'm not I'm, I'm i've been snowboarding a while but i'm not like the whiskey guys or like right shit, right like, right right but the types of jokes these guys would play on each other and i won't say the company names but like big companies and you got the owner and the sales exec and the but they're all just like 25 year old fucking and as a joke at two three in the morning four in the morning anyway when the guys have rented their different cars one guy's passed out so they take his rental car and they rip it around it's the it's the village or whatever bouncing it off the until they fucking crash it in a curve or in the ditch and then leave it run back <laughs> to their rooms, pack their shit, jump in their vehicles and take off. They're already out of town before that. That guy wakes up to the cars, not the cops knocking on his door. Uh, what happened to your car? <laughs> like, it's crazy. That, like those are the types of like jokes they would play. And That's I'm like, insanity. Like, I'm not like that. Man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like, That's bad. But, so from that, Derek Catella shot this catalog for me and all these photos of those guys in here look at these photos those oh, are unused wow. photos those could have been in any magazine like those are from, from photo shoots that they didn't like Derek didn't sell the photos and then said hey you can have this you can have that that's that's a crazy good shot look at the next one Devin with the tool that's right at the, the ski resort with the high backpack on there and that's unreal that's driver right and, that actually, and look at how nice it looks no, like that's a handmade that's like spray painted uh, satin uh we hadn't even figured it out yet yeah it's yeah you just <laughs> um yeah special blend and, uh, that, it just thing. made it so cool oh, this is my favorite tool of all see, time and i gave it a double page spread that thing sold for four dollars and fifty cents that's my favorite tool too this is my favorite tool of all time and you're you're the one that showed me that now, I'm not certain the way that you do it. Yeah, most people would poke this thing through straight, you take the, but you just put that on that you end. Turn it up yeah. So the, the L, and then you put yeah. the short side. Then the you the short side. Driver. Then you've got but a T driver. It's perfect. Which some of the, right. So this was, this is 8 mil, 8 mil, 10 mil, 6 mil. So I and then you got the three. thick. This is this is the genius uh, part of it is that you got the, number the number three, and that's the number two. Two. It's so perfect. Right, because you're, and then you put it. Yeah, exactly. And then you use this. This is just a, a nice soft neoprene pouch that you could just. You could have that in a Kanga pouch. You could have that in a. In I a didn't pocket. because that other driver was bulky, and when you fall, super super yeah. bulky, right? But so this catalog to me was a fucking piece of art. Like the, yeah, the, waxing. I had to go iron. to Taiwan to. I accidentally found this waxing iron. And, oh, that's and I amazing. Was, I tried to get exclusive on it, but uh, later I, I, I couldn't. But I had exclusive for a couple of years. This is beautiful. Uh, like even the shot. Yeah, it's Bjorn. <laughs> so and, high up that tree ride. Jesus. And then. There's your edge tool. Yeah, I could have done a better job of that. With the wax scraper, I made like a school protractor. So 30, yep. 60, 90 and measuring tape. Um, I should have had a better shot of that. But oh, and that's man. funny that you say that. Yeah, I know what you're saying here, but like it's beautiful. Uh, uh, 
Devin. Yeah, there's me, Devin. I think that's Sansalone's board up there because I did the board hangers too. So you could hang your board on your That's wall. a Devin. That's a that's an OG Devin forum. That's sick. That's me and him working on his bag. So I, my first backpack was the Devin Walsh. That's amazing. I forgot about and, you know, that. And he wanted it neon orange inside, you know, so when you look in, like, because a lot of them are black and you lose shit. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you want it very visible inside. And... That's incredible. See, that's the thing of the innovations driven by the people who use the product. Well, the next year, we made it so we could snowmobile. Oh, that's epic. Yeah. Like, carry your board and some of it. The way I like, like yeah, wax, wax, you know. Uh, wax. Wax cleaner. Now, I gotta say, that's a shitty looking bag the first year, but that's my first attempt. At, that's fine. Yeah, backpacks and what well, like our bag program went was crazy after that. But yeah, it's a little it's a little plain, but I get it. <laughs> but you could slide your board through there, and so you could carry your board. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's the wall hangers. The, people still. The board, yeah. People still and need these. You know what, these. man? My mistake with those. I made those out of solid cast aluminum. Yeah, they were heavy as fuck. When I joined Northwave, it's like, why don't I just fucking injection mold these things and chrome plate them? Uh, yeah, chrome plate them. And. Uh, yeah. Well, then you knock the cost down. But then that's how fucking brand loses its soul as well. Totally. I was about totally. metal and aluminum, and then you start to become plastic because it's more yeah. economical. Yeah. Totally. So there's Bjorn yeah, upside Pepsi, down. And then I'm like, fuck leashes, but we need them. The so, stringer. The string. The strapless. They were so tiny. So they it started with these big straps. Fucking, <laughs> binding to your, they just clip on your yeah. lace, basically. Yeah. That's hilarious. Okay, so the there's the A track, man. the G track, Biggie, M track, C track. That's amazing. Oh yeah, the t these were innovative too. That you got because the kit? yeah, because someone would go go to buy a go to buy an edge edger, and you're like, oh, just buy the kit. It's yeah, like you got, it's, your, you got everything. Your, yeah, yeah. And then the high backpack, those were everybody needed them for. Well, for like that, Devin that loved it, man. Devin yeah. rode the X Games with with his. Really? Yeah. Not everyone loved it for sure like yeah that's lame that's gay but, uh, i know what you're saying yeah but i think i think the main concern for us at the retail level was that people were getting them stolen because you would have it on the back of your high back and then you go in for lunch and someone would steal all your shit would just take your pack i don't know man but we sold a lot of those and yeah and then made other ones too and there's that bacota display you're talking about uh, yeah, the power to say, but we made countertop ones Yep. So, you know, that holds five, that holds like 20. I think we had one of both at the West 4th store. I think we had one of these and one of these. The, yeah. It was just yeah, hand man, over uh, fist. We were just selling this stuff like but crazy. The the tuning oh, stuff look may at be. That shot. JP. <laughs> That's Seymour, is it? I don't know. No, that looks like Utah somewhere. Look at that. I'm you, man, it could tell us like now look now just look at how many countries is that is that it? Like that's that's our distribution. Who to call? Canada, Quebec. Oh, this is all Canada. But then there's Japan, France, Switzerland, Italy, Germany, Austria, Australia. Yeah, that's what uh, Now, when look at the next year. <laughs> oh my Once god. Join Northwave. <laughs> so, and I got again, like Catella's photos that Yeah. And my desire for this design is what Oh, wow. Look Bacoda. at the bags. Look at the bags. Right? Like now we're going out. To oh Japan my god. Now. Yeah, you've got like so many bags in here. And the gloves, I had vented gloves. Yeah, and look at the high backpacks. Oh, and everything's now on Drake bindings. Yeah, man. Right. It was a really Look good that. partnership <laughs> with the Heine. That's incredible. Yeah, the Bakoda little pipe gloves. Those were sick with the zippers. Yeah, I did a zipper I vents. I did a Cypress version, a Grouse, a Seymour. Really, that was the names of your, of the of those mitts. I love it. That's fucking rad. And then uh, got into helmets three layer gore so yeah so 
So this catalog and the and, and those guys, like, just like that contrast, went from that to this. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. MacGyver Driver was that in that one, or is that new for this? Was that the big new one for actually, this season? This is probably my last season. I was yep. with them for three years. Yeah. So the MacGyver Driver is looking pretty slick there. Yeah. Uh, in the first catalog, again, it's a, it's prototypes, man. Like yeah, yeah. And yeah. this is before three D printing and uh, machining. So right. Like we're like uh, ha not me, but we had Al, industrial designer. Uh, that was uh, Matt Hexamer industrial designer i think he's done a lot of stuff in the industry like for scott and bell okay but in those days he did some of the gloves i but me and matt worked on the MacGyver driver that was some serious engineering i remember being in taiwan because that so that tool you know that tool is based off a after i sold my I, my dream car was a fucking Volkswagen Jetta. Nice. VR6. Yeah. Uh, five speed. Sick. Oh, God. I got to tell you this story, man, because going back and forth now to North Wave in Seattle and Vancouver. Yep. And up to Whistler. So the car key, that push button, Click, man. And then it would shoot. I love that shit. It'd be in my pocket and I'm playing with it. So I'm driving up to Whistler one day, got my sunroof open in my navy blue Jetta. Uh, half the speed of jimmy and uh that's when i just had the idea wouldn't it be cool to make a tool that snapped open like that yeah so that was the basis of the macgyver driver yeah and fine with all that but then i'm like i gotta get a pipe in here too <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally and so i ended up integrating a pipe and so it's an actual brass pipe going through there and a bowl and now i'm in taiwan like checking the samples and i'm like i gotta test the pipe I smoked weed in those days, but not tobacco. Right. And tobacco is a whole different animal. So I'm in this little factory office with these, the owner of the factory, my agent, the engineer, and um, and all I had was their Taiwanese cigarettes, which are not like ours, right? And so I put that in there and I hit it. They have no clue of pipes or anything. They, 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 I exhale and they're like, you North Americans find the most crazy ways to smoke. <laughs> and meanwhile, that tobacco over there is, was made me so high. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, okay, it works. <laughs> it works. <clears throat> they, yeah, they didn't know what we were making it for. But yeah, the MacGyver driver had to be smokable. Jimmy driver was smokable. And... um so yeah, we joined Northwave. Um, so after this trade show season, and I met uh, Johan at the Dekine booth at because we would, you know, we weren't competitive. It, like yeah, the, the guys at Dekine, we exchanged catalogs, and Johan, the uh, sales director for like Northwave, there was the distribution uh, out of Seattle, and but the company's out of Italy, right? And uh, and also the marketing was out of Seattle to give it all the North American imagery, totally. right? So yeah, they did N boots for a while before they were comfortable with the North Wave name, and they had to buy that trademark too. Someone had that windsurfing company, but oh, really? Crazy. But Johan um, he loved it, and uh, I don't know, man. We stayed in touch, but I'll tell you, our sales for Dakota were the highest ever. Yeah. Oh shit! I got to tell you about the ad we did though. The Devin Walsh ads coming up to the trade show. So you're right. Devin Walsh was the first. So we bought a full page ad in Transworld three months before the trade show. It was black. In the middle was just said Devin Walsh and a lightning bolt, a cloud, and a lightning bolt hitting his name. And then it went through and down. There was Bakoda. Sick. Then the next issue, another one. But now we added Michael Chuck and Sansalong. And yeah. the trade show issue was a double page spread, black, with fucking JP, Jeremy oh, Bjorn, damn. Dan, and crazy fucking trade show, uh, yeah, in, in Vegas, uh, the SIA, and and so that all that energy, right, and then all these orders, but fucking snowboarding is seasonal, <clears throat> so great, our sales are way up now. Go get the money to make it, and. Um, so that's yeah so uh i started talking with johan sims also and an investor from uh, up in pemberton and uh sims was going downhill in 
10 different ways. Totally. And the investor, that could have worked out. But Northwave, as a European brand, but with the North American branding and like what they had done, plus they just bought Drake, also Italian. But now um, with this, uh, I think Dane, uh, these guys, Dane and Gumby, were from Ride Snowboards. And you know the whole Ride explosion with Tim Pogue and yeah so these guys I think I think could be wrong but sort of get ejected at some point mm. they're like fuck all y'all and then they they uh get distribution for, and for Northway Drake it was those guys they should have bought Pakoda but they got me in to, with like then the Italians now we're working out of our house in North Van man Peter Lyon it's coming by like all these guys on their way up to Whistler to like wow. get wax and shit. They just drop by like on the, yeah. Like Dave, uh, Chris Brown. Uh, yeah. Jamie, Jamie Lynn, I think like, <laughs> like wow. come get stocked up. And, uh, so we had this buzz going and I'm like, fucking Sims is, uh, is dying. Northwave is legit in Europe and is legitimate, legitimate, legitimized from, uh, Seattle. Totally. And, uh, so I had this idea in my mind that you sell a company. If we do talk about Dragon's Den, you'll see why I lost yeah. this idea, but you sell it for one time sales. And uh, so I made I made an offer, and uh, it seemed like Gumby and Johan. Actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. I approached those two specifically. I joined on Seattle just for distribution. Right. Gumby's like, fucking, we love this, man. We, hundred percent. But we don't want you to go and sell it out if we build it. So we want first. Oh. That's what happened. But so after that, then I get a call from <clears> Sims, <throat> then this other. So then I'm like, Gumby, I'm getting some calls here. And, uh, and then that's when the negotiation started. But I was, you know, in my mind, nothing's ever going to happen. Gumby's like, I'm like, this may never happen. Gumby. He's like, don't worry. You get everything shipped here. You don't have to ship to Canada. You, you can, he was so certain we were going to do the deal. Wow. For months we're negotiating and everything I had shipped, even to the point where it's now September, it's time to ship to stores. I drove down there. I packed my own fucking orders <laughs> in the morning and then sat with him in the afternoons because this may not work, but accounts receivables work, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, dude, that's crazy. I forgot about that. He he had such confidence we were gonna get there, and the Italians had to fly over, man, like like Johnny Piva and like his main accountant, and go through our accounting records. And now, listen, when you sell a company, there's two ways you sell it. In there, you you sell off your your brands and your IP. Yeah. So sometimes people are like, "All I want is your name. I'll figure out everything else." Yeah. The other way is you sell everything and th most people don't want that because they don't know the skeletons in the closet we, right we, you know we don't want your tax burdens and shit <laughs> yeah. i'll say this man they went through our records which my wife which was my girlfriend back then yeah came my wife and she did such a good job they were here two days everything was so clean man we sold our company had three installment payments <laughs> now listen i'll say as an entrepreneur we don't know what it means to get paid right like, consistently right we don't know that yeah like it's feast then famine and then borrow to have little feasts while yeah until the next feast so i do this deal at the tallest building in seattle too man i'm like Lynn, i can't believe we're looking at planes are flying right by the window we sign it we get our first check we had sex in the car, like <laughs> in the parking lot, man. Um, and that was it, man. And then, and then I had a contract to run Bakoda. So now I'm getting paid every month. I was like, this is crazy. Now I'm in with like this cool team. Oh man. It was all game changer after that. And, um, yeah, we move out here in Devon and then like meeting through and then budget, more money came. So more products, more, uh, but, uh, yeah. So I, how long how long did you work as brand manager 
through north three Wind. years three years three years from 98 is and the i sale. felt like you in carpentry school <laughs> oh no so you know i i want to say like look man i feel bad too because derek all these photos yeah that catalog 1400 bucks man and the next catalog was like four thousand dollars in photography like right working right. out of my garage and like and like making some legit shit like um i was happy like more than happy doing it don't get me wrong it's just being seasonal is so hard right and uh i was never about the money i was never money chasing as a matter of fact you know like i i think i told you offline but that screwdriver when we first showed it at the trade show it had the wrench it had four bits in there and uh, that's how we sold it and we were the first ones to have this t-handled screwdriver uh Dekine had like the bullet one at the time and i got this because i went to taiwan and, and i saw this first yeah after me everyone got it yeah um but uh so maybe the second year after the trade show that's when I realized that man, dude. When I got into magnets, holy fuck, dude! <laughs> <laughs> I'm still into magnets. I'm like, they Let's blow know. me away. Like, you can do so much. I want to do. I want to do a glove where the cuff is inside your jacket, and then the glove part you can take off. But then when you put it back in, it magnets click right yeah. back to the yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I can want feel that. that. Yeah, I want that because I take my glove off so often. <laughs> oh, would you? Yeah, man. I, was I can with, see it right now. I was talking with Rory Carr today about what happened to the Bakoda name, and he so he bought it from from North Wave Drake, mm. and he let's get to that. And he wanted to make money from it, but he couldn't figure it out. But I'm like, dude, we should re we need to redo this. Like, we got Kevin Bakoda. I was right a here. snowboarder then, right? Like, it's different when you design from the inside yeah. from the out yeah. than from the outside. Yeah. I never designed for anybody but myself. I just just heard Rick Rubin say he never made an album for any fan ever. That'll fuck you up, man. Yeah. Like once you say, that's like using Google Maps instead of like your internal map. Like when I go inside my head to map it and then I start listening to Google Maps, it fucks me up. I'm like <laughs> it's one or the other. It's, it's and terrible. I really think it's two different parts of the brain. And yeah. um like I've met people who are incredible musicians, but they can't jam, like they can't make anything up. Right. Like I can make all kinds of shit up, man, but I can't learn how to play Stairway to Heaven, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And so I double down on that. My brain is not made to like learn some thing like, like, so like that gets into like maybe ADHD and like, different uh ways our brains are made so even when i make jokes about like i'm a loser i'm an idiot in tarot cards the very first card which is number zero is the, is the fool because the zero the fool there's nothing to protect there's nothing to like it's always starting from nothing so what can you take away from me when when i'm already nothing right right and then i can be things and i do things so I, I, yeah, I have, the, so I, I create some products like that, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, being the fact the carpenter, holy fuck, man, I haven't had a boss in my life, mm. like since I was 16 or something, it's shoppers drug mart, right. you know how many jobs I've been fired from or just decided I wasn't going to go to work. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I'm tired. Or I'm with my girl and I'm delivering pizza from like six till 11. And I'm stoned right now as fuck. <laughs> nah. And like, <laughs> but you know, when you find a passion, this is the thing, man. I don't know for everybody, but man, when you get sparked by a passion, holy fuck. And mine had like some economical, some economic uh, potential. Sure. Right? Within snowboarding, I wasn't after the money. I made money. I wasn't after it and uh, sold the company. I didn't even know what to do with the money. I bought a, a fucking Volkswagen. <laughs> I remember you coming into the shop after and being bummed. Is that right? You were like, I'm not, I don't have the thing to do. The fucking, 
the the designing the drive the excitement the thing is gone i sold it it was like i should have kept it it was like my fucking baby yeah yes and no am i wrong on that i feel like there I'm, was maybe a year after where i've you, done two ventures since yeah where you came in and you were just like fuck i don't know what to do with myself right now yeah man like 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 possibly yeah it actually man and then i, I did i quit after three years mm -hmm. because i didn't like to see the version of me mm. under a boss mm -hmm. like there's there's i and there's self and when we went to our first trade show and now someone's telling me what to do and i just saw my personality shrink and I didn't grow up around like a bunch of dudes trash talking each other. Like I, I didn't have that trash talk back type of thing. And fuck, I hated to see my, and actually I didn't even want my kids to see me with these guys. Mm. Um, and I couldn't fix it in the, that, at the level of persona. So, but I had a great job. I was flying all over the world. I'd be in Asia for a month for all these factories and then come home and then to Vegas. And then our booth is flying off and we're smoking weed and the cops are just like, don't, Brett Tippy just got arrested for weed. It's like, you better not smoke weed here. We're like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> that was the year I think Jimmy took a golf cart at the Treasure Island, I think. Uh, and no, I think he jumped in the boat at the Treasure Island. That's what it and was. And they were trying to catch him and he's getting, trying to get this way and get that way. And, <laughs> Um, I know, man, like snowboarding, I don't even, I almost said the word, it was so punk, but we were stickering cop cars. Uh, it was crazy, but I wasn't like the whiskey guys. Like, man, when that video premiered, holy shit. Some next level shit right there, huh? Holy shit. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, you Just right. that first shot in slow motion. <laughs> 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 oh, <fuck. laughs> and then the movie starts i'm like fucking talking about storytelling and filmmaking right i'm like where is this going yeah but like other stories but like those guys i i wasn't like that like like uh but some of the guys uh definitely work the cash-ins of the world sure yeah Jump his clothes uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah uh, yeah yeah but was... just to tie that up yeah it was a good sale um i finished as a creator i created something i remember the very first the, all this journey through and uh and i completed it and yeah. and i let it go and then i i went on uh to uh proflix which my brother started oh shit i forgot about proflix the fucking flip books with the pictures in them right yeah, man. But Damn. my brother patented the shape. Okay. He put a rivet in it so you could also fan it out fan so it. you could mm -hmm. yeah. write stuff about people that, yeah. you, that people could read. <clears throat> now, my brother worked for me and my wife, and we sold Dakota. So he's like, now what? And so for, he made all the displays for a year, but then he came up with ProFlex. And then he went right to the skaters. I think, I don't know, man. John, he, like, I'm surprised. Like, now he's just down in the basement. And that he's, now he's got. John Cardiel, fucking Proflex, uh, Nate Bozong, is it, it? Is that right? Like, yeah. I'm like what? And then Trans World's like fucking ordered, I don't know how many to put with their magazines. So now I'm at ISPO in Germany for Bakoda, and Trans World's walking around giving out magazines and Proflex. I'm like, this is sick. I can't even. But that is such a deep cut because. I I haven't thought about it since they came out, but like that was crazy. Like that was the era of like, you well, know, like you needed to see. Yeah. like this wasn't ski. Like you needed to see the sequence shots. What sick. a way! To, like this is forty shots. This is forty pages. Of... He just made that up out of his imagination. Like that was his. his yeah, thing. I mean a flip book, whatever, man. But his thing was, uh, he was the shape, the die cut, and the rivet. Yeah. So that you could uh, fan it. And um, that's so dope. Because then you could actually have, you can write stuff. So Mark used to interview these guys. I think one of his questions on one of them was Your house is on fire. You can carry five things. What are they? <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Something like that. That's amazing. 
Yeah. I got it. Someone sent me a ProFlix book. Somebody's got like a stack of them somewhere. Cardial. There's a one. documentary on Cardial. Yeah. I, I think I remember in there he says, and then the craziest thing, I think he says, that, yeah, some, some guy wanted to make a flip. This is after his accident. I didn't know about yeah. his accident. Yeah. And then some guy wanted to make a flip book on me. Yeah. Yeah, that was my brother. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. So that go, that goes on for a, a couple so of years. So I quit, Miro. Yeah. That was a big deal for me to quit uh, Bakoda to take over ProFlex. And uh, there was a lot to do. And oh shit, Neil Wilson. Wow. Right off the wall, the Can Ams. Yeah. He joined me as well, man. Wow. And okay, so my brother, because of Trans World, some French guy who distributed all the snow, all the action sports videos. Yeah. Extreme, extreme sports videos, something like that. Yeah. He'd come to the shows, you know, Mac Dog, have his video. Like this guy got the rights to all these videos, did it for Europe. When he saw ProFlix, he, oh, this is fucking awesome. He wanted it for, it's a flip book. Yeah. It's paper. Yeah. Yeah. It's 40 photos. Pretty much. Hey, go do it yourself. But once I joined, I said this. We're not selling flip books. We're selling ProFlix. We're selling the brand. Mm -hmm. We're not selling. If we sell flip books, anyone can go make flip books. We got to have our name on every single flip book. So ProFlix was on everything. Then. Uh, it's a good name too, actually. ProFlix. And then, the, and then uh, a movie, who, Matrix, the second Matrix. They ordered like 10,000. What? They wanted to give them out as people were coming out of the movie. Wow. And it's double-sided, by the way. Yeah. So you yeah. get to, you flick flip it over way, and you get a, flick that So way. we did like Trinity on her motorbike, and we did one where a guy jumps in a car and it crushes. I want that. And it had a pro flicks down the side that big. <laughs> so I was clear on this, we're selling a brand, not a, pro, like, not a flip book. Right. So the guy in France sees what Mark is doing with Transworld, and then he wants it. And we're like, we will license it to you. Nice. And it'll cost 25000 just to sign the contract. Mm -hmm. And there's quarterly, min like this is when me and Neil started to work out licensing agreements, quarterly minimums. I don't care. You know, salespeople will tell you anything. Yeah. So it's like, okay. Actually, mm, I'm not going to say I learned this from Jamie, but... I was going to say, this sounds like some Jamie <laughs> shit right here. This sounds like some Jamie shit, oh, shit. right now. But listen, uh, from my heart, but the, yeah. okay. So, I mean, and again, this could be a story, but part of how Ride grew really fast is based on all the momentum, he'd get people to sign into future contracts. Mm. Now, if they didn't sell the amount, they want to cut back. It's like you already signed into it. So, but with licensing agreements, you can't let people just say, ah, I'll do these numbers. I can sell 10 million, right, you right. Know, so then you know what I say? Great. Let's sign a contract where you pay minimum 5 million. Right. You say you can sell 10? Great. Let's say minimum 5. I let them talk first to see, and then I back it up yeah. and go after this. Like, you got to pay to here. And so, so then we license to England and then Spain and... Wow. Bro, and then Energizer batteries, Spider-Man came out, and they wanted to put Spider-Man 2, I think it was, in with every pack of energy. This is the <laughs> gift you got with the bat. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so big. I had no idea ProFlix went that big. It's Liverpool, insane. Arsenal, Manchester United. No way. Our British partner. Come on. He got those four teams, man, and he did a ProFlix on... <laughs> And he got with a magazine, so the magazine's giving them away. But I, so then I sold though. I, I, I hated it. Yeah. I fucking hated it. I was selling printed paper. Right. My, and right. my brother's right. idea. Right. I didn't realize how important it was for me to create. That's interesting. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. So I sold my shares uh, to the guy in England. Um, we had a nice house at the top of Mountain Highway from our, that's what we did. We bought a house, <laughs> 10th house from the top of Mountain Highway. We're all, everyone mountain bikes, man. Wow, Up nice. From our dream house. Uh, uh, sold that, separated from my wife, uh, and then I went traveling and uh, I didn't work, but then I was incubating, incubating, and I had these different ideas. 
And one of them, I, re- I still love this fucking idea, sugar boogers. What sugar boogers? It's, uh, you ever see, have you ever or seen a kid or done it yourself? Not as an adult, I hope. But pick your nose and then eat it. Sure. That's a sugar booger. So <laughs> I had an idea to make a candy out of that. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, like a, like a, like a Pez. But you you pick, pick you, the nose of the be like, candy, and there's a thing in there that you get. There could be some gummy. There could yeah. be some like crushed. Key, you know, some yeah. boogers are hard. Yeah, <laughs> some are. That would be good. <laughs> this is a good idea. <laughs> it it is, is a good idea. I saw yeah. my kid do it, and I'm yeah. like, sugar boogers. <laughs> sugar and boogers. then you just buy refills. Yeah, that's it. Of this press. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I went to India. I did. Uh, 10 day meditation uh retreat and uh i didn't i'm like i zeroed out i went back to zero and then i let these ideas come up and uh calvin so the calvin tool came up as at that time as well um and you know at that time i realized i'm born for function not fashion okay it, in business I, I feel there's two types of business the function or the fashion you know a restaurant's all fashion clothes all fashion um but function is is where my brain is oriented is towards how can I make this function better? I'm decent on branding, but like there are people that are have shit products, but incredible branding. Good branding. So right. that's great fashion. You know, this is a ratio. I'm like 51 function, 49 fashion. So I had the idea for Calvin and I'm like, uh, and I have these three other ideas and I'm putting money into them, pushing them. And I'm like, function. I know people need a multi-tool to hang a picture, to put their IKEA furniture together. Yeah. To uh they get behind their stereo system or to like I know people can use a Leatherman for for, for the home. And so I just doubled down on the Calvin. Yeah. So I, it was like a I year. I feel and like half. showing it right now. It's right there on the thing. Yeah. It's but that that was a year and a half. I just took off and then I doubled down. Because it's basically, I just pulled it off the fridge, which is a great spot to have it, it's, right? Because it's I, just I right it there. To, yeah. It's got a measuring tape. It's got, this one's got 36 things. It's got like a hammer you can use. It's got a light. Uh, you got the bottle opener. You got the, a bottle opener. But I snuck in also like the wine opener. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then there's, you know, like this light right here. And it's, uh, again, you've got the key thing where it's even, flicking. You didn't even flip up the, uh, and then you got oh, like, wow. all in here. And like, I made this like little exacto knife. Oh, shit. That you can like, like that. But it's also, as a bit, it fits in the end. So you can. Oh, so you can turn it into. Uh, you can put it in the end. So it's like a screwdriver bit as well. Yeah. And this exacto knife bit you invented. The, uh, uh, yeah, man. Uh, yeah. See, that's uh, this is what I'm talking about with you and your inventor brain. Is that this is actually fucking genius? This is this little one <laughs> bit. It's got the little fingertip if you just want to use it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one thing is worth the whole tool, and is like the inventor's dream. Uh, is that you've got this. And on top of everything else. So <laughs> my wife and I watched the uh, Dragon's Den. It's got a level in it for hanging a picture. This is what she wants. The, Beca- the 36. Yeah. The, twi- yeah. the uh, Dragon's Den was uh, 23. Was the 23. But this one, man. Like, yeah. This is, this is my boy. It's killer. <laughs> it's killer. And like they were saying on the show, you know. This this is just the first one. Oh, I want to be invested in the in you creating the next oh, one. And he the didn't next know one, that I had one. a camping tool already worked oh, on. Oh wow! Man. Like Look I, at that. Yeah, he didn't yeah. know this was already being worked on. Like, right. I'm like, I got so much more. Right. He knows. Let's go. <laughs> he 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 knew that the genius of the first one was just the beginning of it. It wasn't the end. The end of the line. The line with expanded Calvin, every year. With Calvin. So before Dragon's End, like, do you want to, we'll talk about Calvin then, yeah. Then, Let's uh, do it, because this is the extension of the MacGyver tool, essentially. It is. So I said the MacGyver started from a push button, snap yeah. open, and yeah. so the key with this, 
it starts there yeah and then it, it becomes the tool and then it's like what actually i should have put the bottle opener in the first one because it was in the macgyver driver yeah 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 yeah, and yeah. also man i gotta say i regret i should have snuck a pipe <laughs> yes there's no pipe in the in the because calvin's not smoking you weed. know why because we're like we're on qvc like we're in canadian tire we're in home depot right if we got kicked out of zoomies because the news went like i don't know the details of that i, I was backpacking but uh dan from north wave it's like did you hear we're in the news like and the he the headline was snowboarder gets caught using how is it snowboarder gets caught using a pipe as a binding tool or something like that oh wow <laughs> um that's epic it came out that these tools you could smoke out of and zoomies uh, was like we're a zero tolerance on and drug this shit is like right right 99 2000 <laughs> like something like that yeah so, of yeah. course of course so you know with the retailers i'm in man in those days i'm like can you if they find out that all you got to do is poke a hole and now it's a pipe <laughs> that's what it was you had to poke the hole remember you had to poke the hole that was a part in the of jimmy driver the jimmy driver but not right. in the macgyver no right. like you look in it and you're like what are all these holes for because yeah, it's <laughs> definitely <laughs> a pipe it's 100 percent a cool <laughs> fucking pipe yeah that's awesome that was amazing. So I, I zeroed it in on that and um, I had money still left over and I spent it all getting this going. And I applied for Dragon's Den season two when I just had drawings. Yep. And I got rejected. Yeah. I, but I, you know, Dragon's Den isn't really for real businesses, but um, you, you can't wait that long. You can't. No, of course. So anyway, I kept going on it and I got some traction in China. I went to China and I, I got, so I get prototypes made and I was still getting, I met with a candy company for sugar boogers. For real. Yeah, bro. You know what? They were like, because I already had drawings and some branding. They're like, you can sell this? I, and I didn't have much money. He's like, I don't know, molds. It's like, they said, if you get orders, this is what I mean about different ways of financing. Yep, yeah, right. If you have an order, for sure, we we'll will make, make this. this. You know, we, like, we will do this. You just reminded me of something crazy, a kinship that we have across the years that I felt probably because you inspired me, there's a good chance that at one point I wanted to make and we all know these you know the smelling markers they smell like different fruits that we've had them since we were kids yeah i wanted to make the disgusting version of those so of course like, red is blood green is vomit yeah brown is shit yellow is piss like i was like i already got them all it's like it the idea writes itself i called the bic pen company and talked to someone in product development uh, and they said this is something we could probably do what are your numbers and then i got scared because i'm like well, i don't have dude, any orders you, you, you or shot anything. too high you got, i shot way too you high prototype first. i shot way too high you but, know my brother with pro Flix, he he'd go to the skate parks and because he get down sometimes, he's like, I don't know. And he and the kids are like, Oh, fucking, this is dope. He's like, that. Yeah, you gotta like proto. You gotta you gotta have your prototype mode, and then you right. go to, you go to bed. Right. I went great all idea. Way to and went all you way know to what? Some of those boogers I didn't say were gonna be like uh, puke. And, yeah, some shit flavor. Yeah, you. Not, they're not all sugar. Kid, yeah, yeah, <laughs> kitty but litter or something. Yeah. I have another one. I've just this is my last one. I'll pitch you because I love this idea. This and I've is loved still it possible though. for twenty fucking years. Inflatable tents where you just it, you have the floor is like thermarest, so you don't have to bring a fucking thermarest. And when you inflate it, that's inflatable poles. You don't need to bring any poles either. So you just like roll it up, and then you just got you could foot pump it. Now you got the whole floor is soft. And the poles just Bro, inflate this themselves. is an era of inflatable technologies. Like, Dude, like bam. not just like uh, paddle boards. Like I'm seeing right, right. people, because you get like structurally, you can have something this big that becomes something that big. Huge, right. And um, th that's the key from this. Magnets. So inflatable tents with magnets where you have like a room. Now click, it clicks to the next room. Now you got to, you make a little inflatable tent village. With different rooms. I don't know. I don't think like you a need hamster be, thing. I, right now, my I, I don't think you need even magnets. 
<laughs> yeah, it's true, like, right? Like, Pro- unless you want to drop a room divider down. Or, That's what or I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like magnet in a window on one wall. Click. Now you got a fucking window instead of a and also a flap. the air as a pocket has to have a high insulating value. That's now right. you got to think God, about. Yeah. Um, you got to think about uh, vapor. Right, right, uh, but, right. But Moisture the, barrier, right. But, so like it that's has built to be in. La- yeah, it has to be. It has to vent. Yeah, right. And then you could have solar click solar panels on the roof that run little fans for for constantly moving airflow out of these things. Well, so that are built into the walls. You, no, hold on. Yep. <laughs> see now, I see how my brain works. So you start with pro- that product. Yep. And con- concept, and then you go. There's going to be at least three versions. Right. Three price points. Right. 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 So now you're already working your way up price points. Yeah. With solar panel and but uh, work your way yeah, back yeah, yeah. down. Okay, the most basic what's is the just string a, leash. Yeah. Right. And then what's the right? You know, what's the like, coil like, leash like, like, and what's applies. the locking leash? It's right. like you're going to come into this category, come in with a line that, that hits uh, at least Bam. three different Bam. price points. Bam. Bam. Yeah, that's great. And. Uh, and then have a technology that you own that applies through all three. That you're like, this is the base, so I know the business I'm in. Right. 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 And that's another key question. What business am I in? You know, like uh, with printers, for example, there was a time HP and Epson, and th- like they're in the printer business. Yep. Then someone sat down at a meeting and said, what if we were in the ink business? Right. Like, what would that look like? fuck man Gillette did it what if we're in the cartridge business right not the then you give your handles away for free you give your printers away for 50 bucks nothing yeah because you're in the ink business because you got that ink replacement system going just something to keep in mind because like once you go okay yeah I'm here with everyone else I I have a coffee shop but what business am I really in right Uh, I'm really in like uh social gathering business so i'm really in a so with that bro that's a great idea thank you I, I, like i i can see that somebody's already developing it somewhere don't they see, have to this be. is the common thing right right like see this is not how my brain works i'll get an idea like that oh it, I, okay like maybe if it's right here yes it is so covid and hand sanitizer right uh now uh what I realize, if you look at my nails, I can fucking rub my hands all day and I'm not cleaning out of my nails. Yes. So here's a prototype I made where this is the lid of a hand sanitizer. No this, way. This is 3D printed. Right, right, and right. And I went to the dollar store and bought toothbrushes. <laughs> nice. And pulled out bristles to make a, a prototype because I'm playing with an idea Shh. of a scrub brush in the... I And I applied for a patent on that and... That's amazing. And I approach. Dude, you are a fucking, you, you'd say you're not a smart guy. You are the genius that comes up with this kind of shit, dude. This is fucking, and you I, made one. That's incredible. And I approach, no, I went way past that, man. Yeah. I've got like a website. I approach Purell. I approach Come like four of the biggest on. Yeah. That's amazing. But the time it took me to get my patent written and, yep. uh, and then figure out the the prototypes because first I wanted to injection mold bristles, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I went through that process, and and I'm just getting paid COVID money. Like COVID money allowed me to sit at Kate's Park and and deep cut around and work on this. I'm in Spanish banks, fucking with it. I have still have a bunch of toothbrushes left. Cause I'm like, <laughs> how can I get bristles? And then I had to get this 3D printed, and then the whole, how do I get these bristles in those fucking holes? And um, yeah, that's kind of, when I do a project, it, that took a year to, yeah, to be nothing. I, to I had, be a, nothing, right? I had a, a grinder, you grind weed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you, so now you have all your weed ground, and then there's a pull tab. So you pull the tab and close it, and then you screw off the bottom. And it's a pipe. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Man, I spent at least 10, 15 grand on that with some engineer out of Serbia and shit. Oh, oh wow. And uh, and I made 3D printed prototypes. Nah, drop that one. <laughs> Do you think that weed made you more creative? 
because it, it makes me creative when I smoke some weed. Jack Herrera. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, like some serious sativa shit where you're like thinking about outer space. It's I, totally before legal I left now. Hamilton. Yeah, I said to my girl, she laughed at me. I'm like, you watch, weed's gonna become legal in our lifetime, mm -hmm. and she laughed at me. Yeah, and uh, it did. It did. You know, and, uh, and my kids. Um, listen, man, I started smoking weed. I have two sons, uh, maybe 10, 11 years old. Like, like part of what I was, I'm not saying, hey, smoke weed. What I'm saying is we're not letting the world tell us what is, hmm, I guess legal or not legal, but really they're trying to say what's right and not right. And I'm like, you don't get to tell me what's right and not right. And especially when you people who talk like you're right and clean, are sitting around and going to the shows and enjoying all the entertainment that come from people who are altering how they play uh, with their perception of the world to create some things for people. I'm, not all my stuff has come from weed, but uh, right there was there was a point where smoke weed every day. <laughs> yeah, I have to test these products, man, and then. I got to go get my kids at school at three o'clock, you know, like <laughs> it's just, um, yeah. I mean, it may be, yeah. Yeah. It, I, like, I like, know like, some, I know some people who are high functioning entrepreneurs and business people. I'm high all day, every that, day. That, that were high all day, every day. Yeah. That, you know, they're, so they're, I, I, I've taken a two week break and I just hung out with, my kids and my brother mm -hmm. and i hit the bong for the first time holy Bam. fuck yeah yeah i you i know but i read a dr andrew Weil book about drugs oh, yeah. that dude knows what he's talking about Santa and Claus. he said <laughs> and he said uh marijuana best practice day on day off because it takes 24 hours for the thc yeah, to get out of your best system practice man <laughs> listen honestly it's like a type of habit like i'm not trying yeah, to optimize a, yeah. like my high right and right, right. um it's just like but i don't want to be in the couch you know with in the cause yeah. and uh because i got work to do right and i feel like i'm up to shit even though i don't have to be up to anything Right. Like, I don't know why. It's like, <laughs> I, I'm I'm literally working on a port, some type of portable power generator for villages. Sick. Yeah. Like, things like that are in my head. Like, I tried you, to... Yeah, you should be you should be linked up with this guy that I met down at Bear Valley. No, I can't be linked up with anybody. Well, he's the surf... Yeah. He's the surfers for water. I forget what it's called, but everywhere he goes now, he brings small uh water filtration systems gets a local 50 gallon uh pail bucket yeah and he and he makes shit, man. clean water everywhere he goes killing people and yeah microbes just yeah in the so water. he's got clean water infrastructure that like it all started from like a big earthquake and he was surfing somewhere there was a huge earthquake and they weren't getting water and he's like holy fuck well what about these cheap filters and then he realized that no one else is solving this problem. It's a huge problem. So, like, same deal with, with power generation. It, if you could use the technology that we have over here that's so fucking well, cheap. Well, like, simplified versions of it. Simple, like, it doesn't right. have to be, like, all these, like, uh, like literally my pr first prototypes was made, like, with a bike wheel. Yep. And, and a pedal because that's it. I'm, yeah. like, trying to get a, a flywheel going. Yeah. Uh, but that's there's a lot of things in my mind like i i have to keep myself focused waves you know? for water is the name of the operation and nice. what, what happens is for him he was doing it and then other people like could we do it too and so he published it uh, like how, like how, his like, system like how, yeah how so it's like oh you're going traveling say you're going traveling to guatemala to get waves because there's good waves there but you're kind of like feeling a little bad that you're not leaving it better than you found it. Well, you can order his package, and to, as yeah. when you're when you go for your two week vacation, you also drop off at a village that they already have identified as needs a water infrastructure situation, and then yeah. you just take a cab there, drop the thing off, 
go for your surf and while you're taking your ho- holiday you're also doing something fucking epically good so it's kind of a cool it's a cool way to do it right like open source bro i thought i could change the world i spent six weeks in the philippines with a, um, a microfinance institute going mm-hmm. to like their mandate was we serve the poorest of the poor so some of the villages we had to go to are like you, you take a bus to here and then a boat to there like four hours they they stay eight billion people on the planet man like four or five don't even uh have banking they don't have atms so this is a, a type of so with calvin at a point with calvin i'm like i'm not in this to make money i'm a generator so i'm like i found this website called kiva where you can make micro loans of $25 to these women around the world. And I started making microloans. I'm like, this woman needs $200 for fishing nets. And she's got, the minimum is 25, she's got like 175. I'm like, boom, I'm gonna loan her $25. These are loans, this isn't charity. And then I, I make another loan, another loan. Like pretty soon I'm up to like 100, 120 loans. And then they pay back and then you make another, and you, because you, you move your money, I'm going to help this woman. I'm going to help this person, that person. So I thought, for me, the best way to help the world is by helping entrepreneurs. And, like, people with the spark. And this website, Kiva, here's all these women. She needs, for her, for her pigs, she needs medicine. She needs fabric for her. She needs a freezer. I'm like, 25, 25, 25. Sick. So, um... Then after I sold, I sold Calvin to Neil Wilson. <laughs> I love Fucking it. Neil, man, he's all through it. But but Neil but like bought Calvin and 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 everything, and so I had some money, and um, I took my kids to tie. T- my sons were like 18, 17, 18. I'm like, here's the deal. I was a single dad at that point, which as a black man, I gotta say fucking like i thought genetically honestly man and so i'm a single dad but i'm a terrible dad and i'm like i'm kicking you out this is what we're gonna do we're gonna put all the furniture in storage and it's yours you get the bedroom stuff you get the and uh and you got to go find your own place but first we're going to thailand uh we went for five months (laughs) and got motorbikes and shit and (laughs) got tattoos and smoked so much weed everywhere bro and actually my son Nathan, he's like, Dad, we're in Bangkok on a patio. We had two joints left before we're flying out. I'm like, Nate, we got to smoke these. Like, I, to this day, I don't know how illegal um, weed was then, but uh, I did hear people being executed in Indonesia. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, right? So, but I, my, I don't connect the dots. I've taken mushrooms, ecstasy, weed into. Ch- <laughs> oh, fuck. Uh, actually. Me and Nate got busted for weed in Mexico, and uh, he was, he's only 14 at the time, and I'm like, Nate, all right, let me show you how to bribe a cop. <laughs> oh, man. Like not, like, not, like, not in a, like, a hood way. No. I'm like, we're travelers. They have guns. We have weed. They don't fucking care. They just want money, they and want they can't speak cash. well. Yeah. Let's hop in the car. Yeah. And let's have some fun. Like, in India, when I got pulled over, I'm like... Do I got the money in the right pocket? Like I'm like I'm getting bribed by a cop. Like, but it, it gets boring. Like then finally in Thailand, the cop. I'm like, how much? Like I have a certain fine. Like how here? But um, where was I on that? Like oh okay. The so boys, Bacoda sold Thailand, and but then I go to travel. This, like to get back to this, bro. I don't know how to help the world anymore because honestly, yes, that's where I going. was there for six weeks, and and I filmed it all. And I came out of there f- feeling like a w- guilty Western person. Mm. Uh, actually, yeah, like, you know, like Westerners feel guilty what we're doing to the men. Holy fuck, these women were well off. They had four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different businesses in these villages. That piggery is mine. That rice field is mine. That food stall is mine. The, uh, the, like, the, the delivery truck is mine i have a stall of vegetables in there 
Um, you know, they eat the bullet, the eggs. Bullet, the eggs, yeah. Yeah. So all those ducks are mine. And 33, I got this woman. She's counting. I'm like, what about those motorcycles there? Because they're, they're, they're hot dog carts for bullet. <laughs> She's like, oh, yeah, they're all mine. How many? Uh, I think 33. Holy fuck. She doesn't even know. I'm like, what am I doing? $25. I'm going to sit. Plus, I found out that woman got her money a month ago. Yeah. They just put her online. I'm like, what game are we being fed? Oh, I wow. don't know how to change the world, man. And when right. I went, I'm like, they are so fine. And I also found out some of them have an economy of Western people. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's mm -hmm. an economy of, of guilt. Yeah. So, bro, I was trying to use, Cal I was saying with Calvin on my website, if you bought it online, I made it so you can, five, five, $25. Yeah. Five dollars was you get to pick. I connected it to Kiva, so you could pick who you could loan money to. So, but then you found in the end that the Kiva there. thing was just a, it, man. It's like any nonprofit. Sorry, not I, any I, I nonprofit. I want to say that. I want to say yeah. that we don't really know how to change the world. Got and it. if you want to know, you right. got to really go there, right? And do it. For, so I almost I met with five women. I'm like, I'm going to start my own microloan thing. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm it's getting ready to. Forget the amount. It probably would have been a hundred dollars each. Sure. But I just sold my company. I'm like, I got money. I'm yeah, gonna change the yeah, world, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm meeting with them, and then I'm like, how do I get repaid? And I'm like thinking, well, what if we can do like then at the beginning, what if we can do like uh, through the telephone? Sure. Type? So yeah. I actually met with a phone company in the Philippines. To yep. is there a way to transfer money? I was getting ready to be my own microfinance. Sure. Uh, type of thing, and then I'm like, they don't need me at all. And I, like, they already have a whole system set up. And not, right. not only that, these kids are running around with no fucking shoes, having the time of their life. Right, right, right. They're the, not inside. Yeah. Like playing video games and stuff on and, their phones. And, and this woman with ten companies. I'm like, where, where are your kids? Oh, I sent them to university. What's he studying? Business. Yeah. He should be here <laughs> studying you. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. <clears throat> there's such this pull to this Western lifestyle. <clears throat> and that's when I started to get more pulled to the uh, more life of simplicity and like where joy, where I can see real joy and happiness. And um, yeah, it just turned me off trying to change the world at all, man. It ain't my business. And if it is, I'm going to make it my business. Then I'm going to go and really um, like get into that. But that, like, that's a bit of a side. That's where I ended with Calvin. Um, the Dragon's Den. It, I just watched it with my wife today. And I got to say, those shows are, are addicting. They're really, like, you can watch like 20 episodes in a row because they're really fun to watch. Yeah, they edit them. Like, they this edit them great with the, with the music and everything. But your episode was especially, I'm going to link to it in the show so people can go watch it. It was especially an anomaly i think the name of it is you're the most legit oh, like the title the title of yeah, it is yeah. like you're the most legit the uh, best best the business best ever business ever so that like it's Something like, like that. Yeah. and and it so they do create the tension with the like and now shark tank is yep it's not just dragon like it's i've seen that it's part of yeah yeah that was best and and le legitimately man Holy shit, man, that was tense. Because Robert, who said that, right after that, he says, "But then I'm out. <laughs> I'm out, right?" But yeah. then, but then, then more happens, right? Like, holy fuck, it's intense. That, I gotta say, man, that was filmed on a Friday afternoon. Yep, in May, that was season four. And I gotta say, man, of all the shit I'd been through, yeah, like out of money, holes in my shoes in Shanghai, like pleading with a guy that i partnered with that's now you know getting shady on me and uh that was the best day of my life that was like you know when you put everything on the line for so fucking long yeah and i'm not into dragon's den tv but like entrepreneurship wise i remember before dragon's den was a tv see this is the thing man i'm a black kid from jane and finch but Sundays, you got Wide World of Sports, <laughs> you know, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. You got your Disney. 
but there was a show called Venture. And I'd always watch that show, Venture. Wow. And so that's before I'm 14. So like I'm 12, you know, this is after all the cool shit. I'd always watch Venture. And um, turns out Venture became Dragon's Den. Like the producer of Venture is the producer of ah. Dragon's Den. And uh, so I, I, I really feel if there's any kind of inventor entrepreneur in me, it, it's genetic. Uh, and, and I've been sort of magnetically pulled in a sense. And then uh, I applied for season two. I auditioned and I got rejected because I just had like nice drawings. But season four, I had prototypes. I had a factory now in China. I had a relationship. I was living in China because of that. Like I had an apartment there. It's there like three months home for a few weeks and back and forth. Fucking frustrating, man, working with Chinese factories. Um, but then we got our first customer, Kohl's, but our first real customer is QVC, the home shopping channel in America. Yeah. And I was like, what? Like... And then Canadian, and then, uh, so then I, I auditioned, and I had QVC, and I'm trying to get Canadian Tire, but once I auditioned, then I go back to Canadian Tire, and I'm like, Dragon's Den's thinking about it, and with Dragon's Den, I'm like, Canadian Tire's thinking about it, <laughs> yeah, and nice. then Canadian Tire comes through and goes, okay, like two weeks before filming, they're like, okay, but can we get exclusive for, for, for this season? Wow. And I'm like, hell Yeah. I went on, they didn't show it, but I went on Dragon's Den with Canadian Tire and QVC. But the craziest thing, Thursday, QVC sends their second purchase order. So their first order was 4,000 units. They sold close to 5,000 in 10 minutes at 5 in the morning, <laughs> Eastern Time. Fuck. They oversold. So the timing is crazy. I'm about to film and we get the second PO. Now in a company... You want to see the sales growth. 4,000, 32,000. Canadian Tire, QVC. That's what I walked on. They didn't show any of that. Right. So, holy shit. I asked, I only, we only sold a quarter million dollars of which, of sales, and then I get a percentage of profit. But I asked for 200 grand for 10. Like I, I'm like, I'm worth $2 million. <laughs> And and the night before, I was going to ask for a, a seven hundred and fifty thousand. I, I was like, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> that's uh, amazing. <laughs> well, you are brilliant on there, and you go back and you check with your partners, with your Lynn, wife, yeah, yeah, and, and somebody else is there. Was it a producer? Oh, or something? yeah. Okay, so right, so that's Spencer from England. So we oh. Spencer. Oh, Dude, I forgot. That's right. He got us distribution in the UK as well. <laughs> oh, nice. Through a gadget company. Yeah. Na like, we're in countries. I didn't, I couldn't read the language of the website. It's yeah. Like, I don't yeah. know, check or something. Because this, these guys, yeah, no, no. I, I had momentum going, It, but fuck, it took everything, man. It, it took was all cool my money. because you went back to them. They gave you a badass offer. And Dude, you I should have taken back it. Back to I them. Taken it. I asked for 210%. You, they, yeah. So then one guy, Boston Pizza guy, Jim, says, I'll do it. Yeah. That doesn't happen, man. It's no. like, I'll do it, but I want more. Yeah. Uh, Arlene's like, I want in on it. And he's like, it's 10%, man. You, so she, now I have both of them. And now I'm getting a bit confused because I didn't. Uh, Kevin O'Leary already attacked me early. And by that time, he left the set. Yeah. Brett Johnson, uh, Brett Wilson who I ended up doing the deal with, he's just like, he knew, man. He's like, these guys aren't going to do it. Uh, and then Robert wanted in um, as well. So I, I, I uh, went to the back once for them to talk, but they didn't show that. And I come out. Then they offered me 400 grand for 25%. Now just twice what you were asking for two and a half times what you were offering. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, that's a good deal. Yeah. yeah. But you went back and you've cooked a better deal. Yeah, man. My wife's like, I think he can get more. And and also, I just saw their energy there. Yeah, and it wasn't like they were. Nobody was pumping the brakes. And I, I, was there's no ego ahead. too. I'm yeah. like, yeah. I have legit purchase orders in hand. Like, yeah, I'm not kidding about like that order. Thirty two thousand times like that was three hundred twenty thousand dollar order. Right, right, right. So one order, one order, I'm and like, they already sold out five thousand in 
20 minutes and yeah. five minutes and at five in the morning like it's like <laughs> this shit's gonna go off i can't wait to get on yeah. again yeah yeah, like... yeah yeah this shit's gonna go off <clears throat> that's amazing but yeah yeah so so i come out there and man i i'm stammering right i'm like uh thank you very much this is a lonely road like this and i'm stammering along and uh, but then i have to collect myself and i'm like so the offer i'd counter back with is 25 percent for half a million dollars yep and then and then arlene's like ooh, sassy yeah like, <laughs> but it was sassy it was because it was like at most people would have just jumped at the 400 and just been like damn this is better than what we were hoping it's twice as much money to play with like we're fucking stoked yeah losing part of the company uh whatever it's between three people oh bro right i'm the only episode that had six dragons oh yeah because they brought in a debbie travis yeah i mean i don't know about the format now but I dragons den all around the world is five dragons right on right. my episode they they had celebrity dragons that's right that's so nuts. i had three dragons plus debbie travis saying she'll do infomercials that was shit. nuts it, it was nuts it was so positive but also the fact that my wife's watching she's like i want that right like it's uh, like yeah yeah it's like so they know what they're neil wilson on. yeah neil wilson neil wilson bro <laughs> his wife my wife yeah that's the shit dude it's the energy yeah. so good kevin okay yeah. th let's let's pivot here there's a couple things i'd love to talk about number one can i grab another beer yeah grab another beer yeah i would like to talk about um being a black man in the space of snowboarding especially around you know i grew up in the ontario whiteness i had the token black friend you know he wasn't what was a token <laughs> dale, dale dale simmons he yeah. was he used to snowboard with us and he's like black men aren't supposed to be out here in the snow man i'm supposed hey, to be man. in the sun black men aren't supposed to swim yeah yeah and you yeah. know what i was my like i joined swim team for some reason and i couldn't complete a fucking practice <laughs> There's no way the coach even wanted me there. And then we went to our first swim meet at McMaster. And uh, I didn't even know how to do a flip turn. And I won that race. What? Oh, <laughs> and I'm like, that's so badass. So, yeah. What does it mean to be black? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. So oh. I think you mentioned that you listened to the Plug podcast that I just reached out to Russell because the Black Lives Matter thing happens, George Floyd happens, and people are posting all over Instagram like, you know, elevate malinated voices. And I'm like, well, fuck, I know Russell and I know he likes to talk. I should have, yeah. I should have him do the show. So I called him. He said, no, I thought, what? He said, no way. And I was like, fuck, like, just like that Wait, white guy calling you... you to be like, Hey, you're black. Like, why don't you help me learn about racism? And he was like, dude, I don't want to do that. And then I said, but so I don't feel you're like that because you have a platform. To... Right. I just was saying, I want yeah. to give you my platform. I just want to hand it over to you. I'll do all the back uh, end. Then he said, cool. Okay. If you do all the black back end, that's all the fine. Black I mean, end, yeah. All the black end. Yeah. If you do you know all what? The... I thought yeah. you were going to yeah. call me Kevin Blackota. <laughs> Yo, Blackota, what's up? <laughs> he was like, sure, I'll do it. And I was like, it'll be fun, man. It was a tough topic uh, to, it was, to cover. It was insane for me because I'm sitting there trying to audio engineer. I had a really crappy way of plugging into my thing. So I had two phone calls that were coming in from opposite sides of the world. You're trying to and, balance and, that out. And then sometimes they would like be saying like real shit about white people. And then they would have to say like, but not Eric, but I'd be like, you don't have to not Eric me, man. I'm learning because nobody's ever been um, generous enough with me to let me know it's what I think is, is really happening for any white person to sit with any black person and, and, and what is black? Like maybe we'll talk about that in a second, but to sit and like, and try and like have some space. So, because like you know you're from the outside like i was invited i created some uh, entrepreneurship type program for schools and then i was invited to two native communities one in sault saint marie the government flew me out there because i'm talking entrepreneurship start your own stuff like here's how to build 
And uh, I'm like, I got to watch as many videos on names. But you know what? When I got in front of them, I was just like, look, man, I'm a good guy. I don't know what's all the lingo. Like, I don't know what's right. Or I'm going to, if I say some shit that's out of line, let me know. But please pay more attention to my intention uh, than the words, which may be changing on us. And, uh, and that's a big thing for me is like people's intention. Mm -hmm. and um yeah also when you're on the outside of something there's a kind of nervousness about it like i've noticed just something as simple as when i was young and it's super dark outside people would say man it's pitch black out here even i met an irish guy he's like yeah it was pitch black but i've noticed people don't say that anymore they say pitch dark so yeah, like they like almost like it's afraid to say the word black, but they're not. That's weird. They're not afraid to say Black Friday and keep like promoting Black Friday, but someone can't say, "Yeah, my friend's gonna be here soon." You know, he's six feet tall and uh, he's got curly hair. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and dark skin. <laughs> I was doing. Is he black? I was doing. <laughs> I mean, his skin's really dark. Jokes Listen, have you heard the Chris Rock? Uh, his his thing like who's more racist? White people or black people? Have you heard that one? I've definitely heard it. Yeah. Definitely heard it. You know, listen, man, Dear White People. By the way, there is a series called Dear White People. There is, yes. Um, first of all, I don't consider myself black. I'm a human being. I'm in a black body. I was born in Toronto. I'm Canadian. I don't... Uh, I think the world tells me that I'm black. Black guys nod at me. A girl laughed at the size of my dick. She's like, are you kidding? She's like, you're only half black. Um, <clears throat> the world tells me I'm black. I don't operate from a place of blackness. Uh, although I grew up, even where I grew up in Jane and Finch, we were all just poor people. There's whites, uh, a lot of brown people with the last name Patel, I remember, in the apartment buildings. Man, there's a lot of Patels in this building. <laughs> Um, we were just a lot of poor people. We didn't even think about that. You know, my dad's Jamaican. <clears throat> He's around every now and then. Uh, my best friend, like mom, dad's Jamaican. She's Scottish. My mom's British. Like, we're just like poor ghetto kids, man. Like, we're Canadians, though. That's why, like, I don't have the same experience as, like, Southern Blacks. Where you, you might grow up now. It's interesting, Russell is like, grew up with the Bushes. Like, I, I, he had two parents, I'm guessing. Sal, oh God, I'm gonna tell you quickly how I met Sal. It was at Big Sky, Montana. Sick. And uh, he's the first, the second, the third black guy, because the first two black guys were at Jay Peak in Vermont. And I'm like, black guys, dude, this is how lame I fucking am. When I say I'm a loser, this is it. This is fucking it. The first two black guys I meet at Jay Peak. <clears throat> and and I have leashes in the car, and uh, and me and Chetty, you know, it's it's like, hey, there's black guys here. I'm like, what? No way. So we sort of slow ourselves down so we can catch up. And then uh, they're like another black guy. And then uh, I'm like, yeah, I make leashes, and, and I go and I get some, and uh, I, I give them the leashes, and the guy's like, dude, this is fat. I'm like, I've got skinnier ones if you want. <laughs> like, no, bro, that's I how love like it. like non-black like the, i'm just i'm just you. a guy right like yep. um but but listen to be half black is not easy it was definitely identity crisis uh especially canadian especially well-spoken and like there is an identity crisis early on but i didn't pay attention because you live through just how you are in your soul and i just and also too maybe in retrospect i think people see your energy and your actions beyond your color. So as I've gone through in life, I've never felt racism. I've felt assholes, at, sorry, assholes. I, but I've done business all over the world in my hoodie and like, you know, loose jeans. So a couple things, man. I'll say, A, the problem isn't racism. I'll say everyone's a fucking racist, you fuckers. You're talking to me about racism and I listen to you just talk about another human being that way, hate is hate, any way you aim it. I'm better than you is 
fucking elitism anywhere you aim it. It's groupism. It's not racism. I think we're being played out on this racism branch of the tree because the problem is way fucking bigger. I'll go back to snowboarding. When we started building our parks, so we had like a bus at Kissing Bridge. <laughs> they somehow pulled in there and rails and shit. And we saw a skier go through. I remember being on the lift with Jimmy and he's yelling at the skiers, get out of our fucking park. Look, as far as I'm concerned, that's racism. It's, it's, it's groupism. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now we come to race and now I don't feel I've had a issue there. I've never looked at it. Um, I just saw assholes. I just, people were never in my way. And, and I think because I created things that people liked, even if you're like, you looked at me and you had doubt, then there's my energy. And then there's the, you, you, you did. <laughs> then bro, there's only one color and that's green. It's, right. I can make money from this shit. So how did you deal with your identity when you had kids? Cause that's where it really is important. I think like for me, my kids are. My kids definitely want to be black. Like, like they want, they're not proud that they're half British. They're not, I mean, there's Filipino pride for Pinoy pride. Yeah. But, uh, my one son, Nate, he likes his black, he doesn't look black, but my kids don't look black. Like, uh, you know, um, but he's got black lips and, you know, and, uh, and there's something, Listen, man, I've been owning it. I got to say, I, I've been in, in my little uh, hermit cave in my RV for seven years. I've left all that world. So I've done a lot of reflecting. Uh, and, um, you know, I listen to Keir. I listen to Russell. I feel like man people say shit sometimes to me and care not to russell but i can listen to care and they'd he'd know it too it's like oh you sound so well educated you ask here if he's ever heard that mm. you know mm. you're, you're so well spoken mm. or or surprised that you have a dad it's like a microaggression like i don't see a it maximum, as a, a I don't, maximum no, bro, aggression, i don't look right. at it that way my brother does i'm like i'm an ambassador they're seeing a black person they can speak to they're not afraid of Mm. you're so well spoken well you're so well you sound well educated well fuck hey, listen i'll say this i'm canadian if i sound like this it's because i grew up in toronto with canadians in my neighborhood i wasn't trying to speak like i come from chicago or compton you know um although snowboarding gets you into like yo dude rad like i'm stoked like totally you know so you get some language from that culture but overall, you're going to meet a Canadian person or you're going to hear one and then you meet them and you're like, oh, you're black. It's like, and then uh, maybe if there's respect that's come from the business world is because I can create shit that makes you money, you know? And uh, <clears throat> I think even Republicans at some level are not racist. They're like, make fucking money and you're good. Right. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like there's, of course, this is about performance like let's keep our line our system and let's make money like there's uh, order and chaos and uh liberals over in the chaos and <clears throat> on the order side <clears throat> so i you know i've had issues with my blackness for a while like neil will even tell you that i, I think i said one time i can't hang out with you guys because you're all white <laughs> i gotta start getting some black friends <laughs> But man, I didn't even know that I just was with white people. And uh, I did gymnastics and swimming, uh, snowboarding. I, although we won the city championships in Edmonton, fucker, I got interception that game. Nice. Um, baseball city championships, gymnastics, provincial championships. Like, uh, I met Sluggo that way, by the way. He was a gymnast. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah Still yeah. is, yeah. Um, so I hadn't thought about my blackness and also the world didn't, I hadn't been called nigger or, or anything like I, I haven't. And when those guys talk about being pulled over by cops, the cops knew our fucking name, 
you know, like they of course they put, but they didn't do anything on my, now my brother got beat the fuck out of, like he got the telephone book kind of beatings Oof. and, uh, you know, but he was a full on criminal, you know, and, and crackhead. And, um, that's another thing, man. I think the guy, the cop with George Floyd, I think he knew him, man. Like, that's a thing. Like, yeah, like, I that's think another it has thing. come out. They knew each like, other. They've worked together and shit. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, listen, I don't know what the Americans go through. That's one thing. Now, the other thing, because of that, th twice, th okay, here's my three incidences with with cops like because after rodney king too i was like fuck you really so one time in vancouver after clubbing i'm going to my car no that's how the other story first it's a monday night i have an audi i'm driving an audi wagon uh so now i've gone up from the jetta <laughs> yeah uh and i'm like out with my bro he's a white guy and we smoke weed all the time, man. Like, I got weed in my pockets. We had a few beers. I'm not drunk. We're driving uh, down Main Street around Main and Hastings. I'm going to take Hastings to come out towards North Van. I see the cop at the red light. I'm an instigator. I pull up beside him instead of behind him. And I'm, it's the hoodie shit and stuff. And, uh, and then uh, goes green. He stays. I go. Now I want to turn right. I do everything precise. I signal. I go into the right lane. Signal. I turn right. Now I'm going along Hastings. And I'll tell you this. This is the difference between Canadians and Americans. Listening to Russell and uh, Sal. When those lights came on on the cop car, I was like this. I'm like, let's go. Those guys in America are like, oh, fuck. Uh, hands it like sounds like hands at 10 and 2. I'm like, let's fucking go. Did you just pull me over, dude? I was out of the car. They had their hands on their gun as they're coming up, and, I, and I'm demanding, What did you pull me over for? And don't forget, I've been drinking as well, but I'm not drunk, but you can smell it. And uh, and the guy asked for my license and registration, and I'm like, you show me. And no, I go, why'd you pull me over? It's like, uh, we have a report. The car stolen. My car is stolen. I'm like, you show me that report. And I don't have shit to go on, bro. I'm just like going on probable cause. Like, I don't think they have probable cause. No, obviously So not. I'm like, you show me the report and then I'll show you my license and registration. And then he says something like, uh, oh, our, our computer's down. Like, uh, da, da, da. And, but my fucking friend gets out, gets it out of my glove box and comes out and gives it to him. Now he goes to check it. Now the other cop's there talking to me. And I'm like, I thought the computer's down. He's like, ah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, have you been drinking? And this is the moment, right? And I, now there I could have been fucked up. Yeah. I was just like, nope. So are you sure? I'm like, yep. And I've got two joints in my pocket here. Anyway, that, it's my fucking car. He comes back. I'm like, give me that shit. I'm like, you guys, are you kidding me? You see a black man driving an Audi and you're going to, are you fucking kidding me? Are you for real? Give me my shit. He's like, wait, one last thing. What color is the car? It's a white car, but it's not white. It's, uh, it's pearlescent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it says pearlescent on there. One last thing. What color? I'm like, fuck you. Now I tried it in Seattle. Oof. And, uh, man, they fucking ran that car door open on me. And the next thing I'm screaming, I'm like, help, help. Like, they yeah. had me on the front of the car. Yeah. I was like, yeah. And it's so a different deal. It's right. a different deal. But the only time I've ever been afraid of cops is in that Jetta coming back from Northway because I'd go down every Tuesday morning to work Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'd drive back Thursday nights. And driving back at 10 o'clock at night, you just want to get the fuck home. And after Bellingham, I just hammered it. 240, <laughs> two, 260, maybe. Fuck. And it might have been Jimmy who said to me one time, he's had flashing lights behind him, but uh, he just made some turns. He's like, man, they, they didn't see the car. And uh, I let my foot off the gas, and uh, but I'm still passing cars. I'm going so fast. The lights are a mile behind me. It's a straight run. I'm like, but I've already given up. 
But I'm like, Blaine is like, I'm almost at the border. And that's when it hit me. I'm in America. I think the speed is illegal. Like, like, yeah, like, yeah, uh, they'll take your car. They'll take your license right there. But it's right 10, 30, 10 o'clock at night right, and I'm black. Right, right, right. What do you mean? I don't know what they'll take. Right. That's the only time yeah. I was afraid. I don't know what they'll take at night. So, man, I remember sliding off the fucking, I had to get off the highway and I was petrified to get to the, I, I expected like all these cop cars. Right. I never, I've never driven like that since. The, but the only time I've been afraid is in the States. And in Canada, okay, I tried to, to when at the start of Dakota, cross the border. And I've never been refused because we used to go snowboarding all the time. I'm like, this, the, I couldn't believe you can't, you're refusing me. And it's like a black woman, this other guy. And I'm like, there's no fucking way. Like, I almost got in the car. Like, you can't, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and, you can't park there. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Dude, um, guns came out. And they're like, you can't. Like, my brother is like, please, Kevin, get in the car. But I've never had my rights violated like that before. So right. that experience and then the fear, because I don't know what would have happened in uh, the, that driving. Yeah. That's one thing, man, to keep in mind. It's not the same here. I lived with my dad for six months in Dade County, Miami. Everyone's got bars on their doors. I watched a woman in a car in my standing my dad's door. This dude just trying to help, like this girl, this woman chasing him, and uh, and the, it just happened to stop in front of our door. But she's fucking got a gun in her hand, Oof. like shooting at the guy who's hiding behind the car, <sighs> and I'm standing like here, and she looks over and sees me and my dad, and it's like. Ugh. It's like eight in the morning. She's like, I got to go to work. I just want to scare that nigga anyway. And uh, wow. he comes over laughing, going, ah, I didn't come home last night. And, yeah, my second year. Bakoda, That's psycho. There's helicopters flying around down there. This is funny as hell now, man. I thought they were trying to catch me as an illegal immigrant. <laughs> oh, <no. clears throat> I didn't know that they're like trying to follow like criminals that have just done like. Yeah. That's yeah. how naive I am. Uh, so it's something really important to remember. It's not the same experience uh, up here. In Canada. Uh, in, in Canada. Right. Right. Uh, I felt like we respected our, our you know, mar minorities, BIPOC members uh, in dude, school. stop like, talking like that. Okay, let me talk. Say, please. please. Yeah. Don't talk like that, man. Okay. You grew up with black people and shit. Like, this is what's happened. It's made white people afraid. All yes. of us. Like, we don't even know how to speak anymore. It's true. We don't know what words to use. Right, right. I'm saying, man, listen, even if you make mistakes, intention is first. Thank I don't you. even know what the fuck you mean by POC. And, right, like, and right, shit. right. Like, Thank you. We yeah. all grew up together. And yeah. now the world's trying to make us confused. And I'll say this. Any group that thinks it's better than any other group, that's the problem call it groupism call it tribalism so i'm not even distracted by the racism thing that i've never seen the george floyd incident right i'm not getting distracted by the by the way right most of us blacks it's like fucking if you don't know now you know you know how long this shit's been going on yeah you know you know about the washing machine cycle trips where they fucking handcuff people it's like we're taking you back to the police station people have they open those doors and there's dead people inside oh Right? So, like, man, and the other thing is, don't even try to know because you can't know. There's so much to know. Right, right. There is so much that we end up getting upset over the wrong... Be careful. Be upset. Yeah. But don't let other people say this is the thing to be... It's like, okay, if I'm going to be upset about a topic, let me look into it. Right. But I'm not going to let you tell me this new cycle. That's it. That's it. I think the biggest lesson I learned, and I said it to you just here, like calling Russell out of the blue was actually the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do is to do my work first. And I owe that knowledge to my wife because she grew up on the res and she just saw this going on around her. And so she's done her work. So I've done like a step or two, right? And the step or two is the same as anything. You want to learn about how to fix the fucking sticky latch on the back of your car? You Google it, you watch the YouTube yeah. video, and you, now you do that. If you want to learn about 
how to fucking be less racist around your friends or how to just like Excuse not me. make your your friends uncomfortable, then Google the shit and then read the books and do Listen, the man, work on your own. Don't worry, fucking yeah. Russell, Sal, right, here, right. me. We all came up in it like... Um, right. Listen, our soul's going to come through regardless. Yeah. And Sal, I remember, man, meeting him at Big Sky. He could barely snowboard. <laughs> and he's working for Transworld at the time. Yeah. And he got fired shortly after. He did. Good thing he got fired because his persona wasn't that. That's true. He wasn't, the, he wasn't the receptionist. He was like, yeah. he's the man. Yeah, he's So dumb. they hired a token receptionist, right? <laughs> Fucking way to go, Sal. <laughs> Sal, Sal, every girl's pal. You got over that, bro. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm stoked that you um, listened and what uh, you know the second lesson i'll say is that um representation is really important seeing somebody who you see yourself reflected in on a podcast or in a magazine or on sal's on change hill. right and yeah. like russell seeing a black snowboarder in a magazine are you yeah. kidding me it was important like i didn't know and people thought black people weren't allowed on snow <laughs> or couldn't afford to get to snow. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. Sal, yeah. Or uh, didn't want to be on snow. Like, oh, they're rappers, oh, they're listen, basketball players. Basketball they're, they're, players. Yeah. I never yeah. played. Russell never played. Right. Like, he was a hockey player. <laughs> yeah. It. That's yeah. So similar. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was a swimmer. He was a hockey player. I was yeah. a gymnast. Yeah. You know, um, it's like uh, I didn't want to be the typical, like the stereotype there. Mm -hmm. But um, partly I'll say it's like, but we are also because we're all humans. That's the key thing, and we're in this body, this this meat uh, this meat vehicle, if you will. And mine's a black one. And um, but I'm just as Canadian as you, yeah. and uh, just as human. And our blood's all the same color. So um, we got to like, and in snowboarding too. But in other ways, we find like our subculture beyond the color culture. And then there, you're just safe within the culture. And um, we're, but we're in tricky times language-wise and stuff, microaggressions. I feel it's, a lot of things are softening us right now where we didn't, we had, listen, skateboarding, you can't soften yourself, man. You, you got to go out there. When you fall, you fall. You, you can't ask the concrete to fuck. Can you be nicer to me, man? Right, right, Like this right. is reality. Right. And then that, that uh, helps sharpen you uh, and, and that's how you grow as well. And also to be aware of what to be upset about. Right. We're we're taking the video game level down to easy. Now we're offended uh cuz we got shot 5 times, you know. You you go up to veteran like now you're dead. Like Yeah. So out here uh in the world I got to say my my energy and whatever I've been doing has definitely outshone, outshined uh any color or or wardrobe uh yeah, I, I, I feel the ca my character, uh, and I, I don't walk around with a chip on my shoulder. And I'll say this, most white people who want to apologize to me, it's like, I fucking, bro, I've accomplished so much, like, by accident. Like, white people try to apologize to me sometimes, and I'm like, what have you done with your life, man? Like, I'm not, like, I'm like, don't apologize to me. I'm not held back. Right. As a matter of fact... I say to some black people to be straight out. This is a good time to be black. After George Floyd, I even said to my kids, black is about to be rebranded because blacks like me were uh, the Uncle Toms, mm. Mm. you know, the Oreos. Right. Uh, seriously. This one girl I met, I guess she sent a picture of me to her sister. It's like, God, oh, look at this guy just met. The picture her sister sent back? This is, okay, I'll say this about fucking being black. This disgusts me, man. This shit. The picture that girl sent back was, uh, you know the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Yeah. Carlton. Yeah. <sighs> this girl's like, look at this dude I just met. And that her sister sends that back. Oh, you got the whitest, essentially, you got the whitest black guy. Right. And there is something there. I haven't been with a girl in over seven years, bro. I'm like, I'm a single hermit right now. And part of it is like the fucking black fetishism, fetish is whatever, bro, that, that I feel from uh, some girls is disgusting. Yeah. It's fucking disgusting. Yeah. And it, it, like that shit, I have no space for. I've, I've heard uh, Asian women 
on the other side of it talking about that same shit. I have no just, space they, for that. They fucking hate it. That it's. I mean, yeah. I've made love, man, and I've had so much bad fucking sex. I'm like, I don't care. There's no. There's not a any beauty a girl could fucking have and get even close to me. It's that soul. Yeah. And um, so so. Uh, we call them nigger lovers. I can say that. And uh, oh, she's a nigger lover. And um, that is disgusting to me. Um, and that's like part of the, like, um, there's, a, there's a lot to the, the black uh, mythology. But this is a fucking great time. It really is. When I got here uh, in 96, I swear I had no black friends. Like nobody for 10, I didn't know a black person. And then I start seeing more black people, more black people. Where they? They're not coming from Toronto, because Jamaicans stopped in Toronto. And I start meeting them, man. Like now, fucking, I got friends from Nigeria. They're Africans, Nigeria, Kenya. Uh, my son Nate, uh, his roommates from Nigeria. Data scientist, by the way, fucking dumb black people. <laughs> um, Albert from uh, Nigeria is uh, computer something in computers. A guy from Senegal. Now I have so many, black, and they're mostly all Africans, and it's not even a conversation anymore. It's it's not even a, oh, a black person. Um, so so there, there's been that change. My feeling right now is black is being rebranded. It's being, and I feel you talking with me is an example of that, because there are black people out there that aren't your hip hop kind of like like not in the direction uh, uh, and acting a certain way, but like have other stories. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you uh, for having the guts to, well, th uh, to even have this. Um, sure. And I didn't think anything that I did was that special, but I, I'm <laughs> a creative person. Fucking awesome, dude. And I got to yeah. witness it. I got more That's my do. favorite thing is that I got to, like, I forget about these little stories that I'm like, okay, like Kevin Bacot, oh, yeah. he. But, like, while well, we're talking about it and you're reminding me, that I got to see you lit up from signing Devin. Like I got to see how excited you were at the prospect of yeah. every little innovation that you made. And now to know the story behind it, that you were like going across the border, going to California, driving all over the place and selling the shit and having the yeah. ultimate snowboard experience right like where you yeah, catch this thing yeah to, uh, yeah where yeah you, where you it was a bug right this bug. you couldn't wait yeah. for the next magazine yeah. yeah how many times were you bro i'd cut out every full page my my bedroom was all these full pages i couldn't you know i had to keep a system <laughs> so just full page shots it was my wallpaper i don't know where that comes into a person man but it, that snowboarding was uh you know, and, and I'm glad you're talking about it because I don't know, it's modernized so much, but the Terry yeah. Kidwell days, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, like... Well, one of the things that happened was that the innovation reached its peak. You you didn't have bindings that were shitty, that the next year they were better. You didn't have a board that was crappy where <laughs> the next Ryan year... did the horseshoe it's binding? Yeah, the horseshoe <laughs> binding. You and, and they doubled down. They're yeah. like, we're not even going to... We're not even do the, uh, the. We're not even changing. They, oh yeah, now you can't get anything else. You had yeah, to yeah. ride the horse. It creates a flat spot <laughs> in my. I can feel, man. Snowboarders were like fucking. I'm hitting that. I'm hitting that. Yeah. Like snowboarders were the first on. Like this. Here's the season for skiing. Yeah. Here's the season for snowboarding. Oh, totally. The earliest and the latest. Uh, totally. And and uh, that's another thing, man. The edges when I gave them an edge sharpener, it's like, <coughs> it's like, okay. And then you know, fucking now I need P-Tex repair because these gouges, like all the, it's true. And like didn't care, like no, didn't care. In fact, did the opposite of not caring. It was like I can remember my friend just riding a broken board. And not even looking at the lineup and going, my board's broken. And he was drunk. He's like, there's like a huge lineup. And people are going, how come that guy gets to go first? He's like, fuck all of you. I, my board is broken. I'm hammered. Yeah, yeah. And we just went around the line. Like, we were assholes, but we were also just not playing by the rules of you know, what like was to, going to on. To me, that's like, you know, that, like that's the punk side of it. Yep, sure. And um and we and we matured like we yeah. matured yeah but then the fucking sport kind of got stolen 
It definitely got stolen. By the Olympics. It definitely and, got know, stolen. And FIS and shit. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and the, like, I really felt like, whole, and th- actually I'll say this as I'm older, like now, uh, now I get it. Mm. Now, mm. now I see how the world works. Right. But I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I mean, I'm a small part, but like we were snowboarders, man. Like, like, and like now you're going to hold some different contest of people. Like, Who's this guy? Who's that guy? Right. Like, there was such a disconnect of like who we thought snowboarders were and then who was competing and like, wait, you totally. got gold? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, the innovators were the people like yourself who were innovating because it was necessary. Well, because I rode. Right. It, okay. The leashes, look, we had to wear them, but yeah. I needed a tool. Yeah. I was losing my shit. Like, like yeah. you yeah. know, like there goes, I'm like, where'd that nut go? And I'm like, fuck, now I got to go down to the bottom. <laughs> and can I get down to the bottom? And guys, wait for me. And this, and this happens up at Whistler way the fuck up that you're like, so I made tools. And then, I, and then I go to Baker and I get off those chairlifts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, oh, this isn't, this isn't talisman. Yeah. I'm like, actually, that's wrong. Getting off a lift at Baker is like riding towels. <laughs> <laughs> Five and six had like it's you know it's still gnarly. Like it's still gnarly, but I mean I can remember we would strap in on the lift because yes. you're so fucking scared. I thought you were genius yeah. too, by the yeah. way. And, yeah. and but you know what sucked? Because I'm goofy. It's it's if you someone was regular. It, we're all goofy. We can yeah. all do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You fucking idiot. You're more <laughs> crossing back over. Yeah, can I put it. my board on you? It's true. Um, but once that innovation <laughs> got to a point where, you know, the big corporations could just compete without having to pay the people who were doing it to innovate, that was the end of it. That's, that's so. The end of it. My edge sharpener I see in plastic from RC. Mm. my screwdriver like like the lock i i told you like with the lock i i do polycarbonate i yep. would do uh the, on the cable polyurethane so it would would retract and cold um so, and it, so i ended up paying that company to do my own outer shell so i had my own design for for it so at least no one could look like mine because everyone was copying totally um, there's only a couple locks that you could get and they're all copying them they're all getting them from the same place. And um, yeah, I felt like Rory, uh, he had Sport Check, he had Sport Mart, but you know, I'm He down. said that today. He said, you can't really be successful without having a Canadian tire or a Sport Check or a. Well, what do you mean by successful? Right. I was fine with like West Beach. Pacific border, yeah. Uh, second wave because well, you like, were riding was with us. Because you were riding with us, and your and your idea of success was like, you know. And I'm working out of my home, and I'm making all this shit. Like your, I don't make, have a yeah, warehouse. Yeah, I don't have yeah. all this. So yeah. I gotta say though, after when I found out that RC bought, listen, I let my child go, right? So yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm happy. And um, then I can't, I, you know, I worked on my brother's child. Pro Flix, and then I came up with with my new child, and uh, I sold that at the end of 2014, and I went backpacking. I've been living like a hermit since yeah, 2015. Very simply, is there is there anything like about that? I mean, I showed up here. You obviously know the dude that's parked in front of you. No, I, d- I just met him once. I know, but you're just like so personable. Like you're such a nice person to But him. I'm black. Man. It's like, are, aren't, they, aren't people supposed to be afraid of me? I just mean no. hermits. Hermits usually it's don't. Not, no, but, no but, yes. I, but you know what right. I mean? I do know that's, what you're saying. Listen, my I do experience, know what you're saying. This, so thank you for noticing yeah. that. Yeah. Man, I can live at Kate's Park. I move all around uh, North Van, the city, Spanish banks. I, I try to be... Uh, like in a deep state of solitude these days, but <laughs> Calvin is uh, social, <laughs> and so this guy that you you felt something there, right? One hundred percent. Okay, that's the second. The, the last time I met him, bang, bang, bang on my window. Yeah, his truck is started, and my bike's there. He's like, "You better move your bike." I, uh, oh, it was like rude. That's how it started. Yeah, this is what I mean. I don't. I'm confused about the black experience for a lot of people. Right. It, it, a, he doesn't know. He knocks. Then he sees a black guy. 
then whatever he sees next, and then whatever I say next, and then I say mi grazie because I learned because I sold Bacoda to an Italian company. Yeah, I know how to say thank you, <laughs> mi grazie. So I said that to him. Yeah, fucking changed everything. Hundred percent. And then now he's back like that, and uh, he was it was so nice to you. Yeah, like I thought you guys were old chums. So this is wh- my experience where, as a black man, and, and I'm, yeah, I'm glad you yeah, saw that yeah. because. That's why I can't speak into a lot of other people's experience. Mm-hmm. That's why I mean I feel something about me, my energy, or like uh, how I re- will relate to people, or I can say thank you. Uh, but something has. I'm in the woods with my dog all the time, man. I don't want to talk to people. Mm. If I almost want to film, this is what happens to a black man in the woods. Mm. Everyone says good morning to me. Yeah. They they say it first, like they. So I'm like, man, <clears throat> I can just go on with character, and um, and I'm just gonna keep my character going, and have these interactions with people. Um, I'm curious yeah. about the hermit thing. I don't know how to ask it in a way that would. Pre- After I sold Calvin, I didn't make a ton of money. I had debts to pay. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not good with money. And so I just traveled, uh, took my kids and, uh, yeah. And then I made the Carl the Winston tool, the grind, and I blew money on that. And, yeah. uh, I just ran out of money before I had another idea. Got you. So, you- and then I faced a point where I could get a job in the industry. Mm hmm. I know how to source and uh, negotiate and design and create products. And so I could get a job in snowboarding and mountain biking. I was deep into mountain biking, like hella deep. The North Shore, man. Like I'd live right on Frome. Brett Tippy, man. And you Brett, mentioned him already. Um, Love Brett I'm Tippy. I'm sitting in my house and I hear uh, alarms go up and it ends up in this film. It wasn't Brett. And maybe it might have been Brett, but it was a big jump that they, they made up there and were filming it, like a huge gap over a canyon, and the guy crashed and broke his leg. Oh, shit. So, like, sorry, no, I'm talking to my wife. I'm down at North Wave in Seattle. Yeah. She's at home. Oh, I hear shit. fire, like, I hear sirens go by. Yeah. I find out later, it wasn't, it, oh, it was one of the, Wade Simmons. Wade Simmons, the North Shore guys. And, and, uh, did it, and, and then I see it in the video later. Wow. So, I could have got a job, but. I'll tell you this. After North Wave, I saw what happened to my personality. Yeah. Inside yeah. groups. I was out of money. I could be making six figures. And also I did a solo DMT trip uh, at that time. And that's the first time I was like suicidal. Well, I'll say suicidal in retrospect. I was just ready to retire mm-hmm. from the... the a game I reckon this was. And, uh, and then I did the DMT, which is, uh, I don't know, man, but when I came out the other side, it said to me, just start over again, man. Cool. You did. Thank you, DMT. I saw, I saw, I had this vision of like a canvas. It was six feet by two feet. It seemed like tall and thin and it was painted halfway up. Uh, top half was white. The rest of it was like a Jackson Pollock type painting and something said this is it some said here's where you are this is life you've you've just lived wow and i'm like wait i did all that like it seemed it came across to me as like all these colors and shit came across as a journey and a story i'm like i did that and that and that and it said yeah and you know what terrified me was because it was and then white and it terrified me that blank space and all it said was you weren't worried then all you got, it's day by day. Like I'm looking at the future and the future looks long. The past is like that. And so it was, you're going to start over. There's things you didn't learn. So that's it, man. I uh, had 20 bucks and a plane ticket to Vancouver. And I went to live with my brother and I started digging holes, uh, building fences. And, um, and then he bought me this RV. Wow. And I named it Walden after Walden Pond, the book. Sick. And that's been over seven years ago, seven years and three months. And you're catching me at a good time because I feel like this is it. Like, like I'm, I'm done with this stage in my life, but I had to this like really 
kill every fucking story of life. My kids were growing up, so the story of father and son, I didn't have a father. They don't need a father to kill that story. Kill all these stories. Inventor, entrepreneur, nope, 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 nope. And listen to the rain and walk in the woods. And I've just been zeroing out more and more, just getting just more like, what is this like all about? And like, I don't have to do shit. I just have to work enough to make some money. I write constantly. I'm working on ideas. Yeah. But under no pressure at all. And then what's crazy, okay, I'm going to Peru in a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. What's crazy is I've been like making peanut butter kind of for fun. I have a machine up there, cost 700 bucks. That's my third or fourth machine. I don't know what I've been doing for two years. I have some concept, which that's another thing. But I've been chipping away at this peanut butter thing. I've even made a website, but I haven't even tried to sell any. I don't know what I've been doing. It's called Shack and the Fool. And then a couple months ago, I decided to buy a ticket for Peru because it's, I do landscaping, make my money. I don't want to work through this rain. I'm going to Peru for two months. I buy the ticket. Then I find out there's archeological sites of the earliest peanuts in human history found in Northern Peru. You know, when you didn't like your carpentry thing, you know how that felt? Yeah. Well, when I heard about the peanuts, I'm going there. Wow. So I don't even know where it is yet. I'm just going to get to Lima and then I'm going to figure this out. But I know. But then I've been buying my peanuts from Chinatown. I'm not happy about that. There's no way I'm going to start a business of peanut butter with Chinese, with Chinese peanuts. There's no way. Like, because money is energy. If I, I'm going to buy peanuts, then you're going to get this energy. And then where's that going to go? To the freight company, to the this, to the that, to the. the I was never happy about my source of peanuts, but I still kept going on it. This is this is this is strange to me. This is, might be fucking. Is that God? Is that you? <laughs> you making me make peanut butter for two years, <laughs> and then get me to buy a ticket to Peru for some reason, bro? Wild jungle peanuts. Never heard of them. Growing in the Amazon. I already had my ticket. Then I find out that there's the Ashuar and the Shuar tribe along the Pestaza River in the Amazon. That's the only place you can get them. Who are the Ashuar and Shuar? Type that in. Dude, the, the Amazon, they're, they're famous. There's like uh, all the uh, mineral extraction and oil shit. This is the area where shrunken heads come from. These guys are famous for militantly... Uh, protecting their lands rad uh of course they're a dream culture uh plant medicine ayahuasca um so now i'm not exactly sure i'm like i'm going there for peanuts but also i know they're uh, at, like in the news for like protecting their in in militant ways and um so business now i see it's all i don't need money i i'm not looking for it uh, i i it's not things that I'm looking for much, but I've been created to create. So that's, it's taken me seven years of that type of reckoning. I'm like, all right, this is how I'm made. I, I'm not made to sit away from people because you see energetically, um, I have some energy that, that I, that's good and that I can share. So my dream right now is I'm going to find the Ashwar and the Shuar tribes my dream is to create somewhere that i don't quite know but i will start a business when i get back with peanut butter and i and that money now i can create a river and i can know exactly who's getting paid what families are being helped sick so, you know like the, sick. It's, this is this maybe gets back to like the you know like the the different people in the world and how do we help well i feel business it, it, that's not the wrong word, right? Where busyness, uh, that, like in a free market, I can create things now and I can uh, channel money and like create rivers maybe uh, to flow to people. Um, so I'm going to go for two months and uh, that's, and, and I'm fucking on fire and I leave on Saturday. So after seven years and three months in, in my RV, man, I, I feel like you're meeting the caterpillar when he's coming out of the cocoon you might be seeing the, the butterfly have you seen bugs life i have y yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm a beautiful butterfly <laughs> 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 
Kevin, this has been <laughs> one of the most incredible conversations I've ever had. I, I'm just so ecstatic that I'm following my shit. And as soon as I found you, I was ecstatic. I was looking for you for years. Uh, and I avoided years. you. Yeah. You you called and you don't That's know, right. but you called Neil Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the off the wall can ams. You uh, to find me because he owns Calvin now. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, well, Neil and Dave. I props to Dave. I'm sorry, Dave, for that. But I heard that you called. I was. I'm not at all into doing talking about myself at all. So never replied to you. The second time, after that, I thought, oh, he just wants to talk to me because I'm black. But this week, I listened to the Russell ones, and I felt. That's when I realized uh, I'm black, man. Like I'm in a black body and mm. Um, mm. I have a voice and uh, I'm not eager uh, or feel a need that anyone needs to hear it. But uh, I do feel some, I'm starting to feel some responsibility um, around that. Of course, they've maintained being me. Yeah. But yeah. that, yeah, man. And and also for blacks on, on the come up, um, and and for other cultures, like it's mostly white people that uh, aren't even sure like how to interact, you know what? Just like come with like integrity and like good intention, and even maybe like I'm sorry if I use the wrong word, man. Like like maybe help me out there. Yeah. Um, but yeah. don't get pushed around too much. Also, if if you're good and legit, like there are some people that have just grown up with black people, they don't have this problem. Like they throw right they, they, like. That's part of it, um, but at the end of the day, bro, we're all humans, man. But you know what we'll never get around? I'm, I am peace. I'm not preaching uh, hope for peace, man, because I don't think we're going to get it because hmm. everyone's breaking off into their groups. So I'm saying don't confuse racism. Groupism is the same thing. If you point at anybody or any group and go, that's lame, it's the same shit. That's Just really as smart. As far as I'm concerned. That's really smart. And if I'm speaking candidly about it, was there something in there? At some point there was when I was like, yeah, and he's black. You know, like it's a perfect guest. But somewhere along the way, I lost that. Like, I just want to talk to Kevin Bakota because it's a fucking great story and he's a fucking great person. You know, when you got That's me, the truth. you asked me about the sale of my company. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I got exactly what I asked for. And you're like, that is rare. And I'm like... <laughs> Wait, maybe I do have, like, maybe I have done something. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, shit, you have done so much. So on behalf of the entire snowboard community that listens to this show, and oh, people man. who don't even, like, fuck, we need a return to that wonderful time where it's like, people who are stoked, people who are hooked on this sport, like, shit. making innovations, and not being afraid to just follow their fucking hearts, dude. That's, that's it, man. That's it. Yeah, just make enough money to live and then don't be afraid to follow your fucking heart. Guys, nah, uh, it ain't it. gonna make sense for a while. Man, that's the thing. You got guys like Devin and those guys just like drinking and <laughs> like, and they are, it's like, hey, pops, uh, I thought you said I should get a job at Subway. I just got 30 grand this month. Uh, I could buy a Subway. <laughs> like, yeah, I love that. So, um, that's something about that, like, really, really, sometimes it's like, it's crazy. I don't know what I'm, it's why I'm obsessed with this shit, but sometimes it's crazy, and then sometimes it pays the bills, but uh, it's through our obsessions. When you're sparked, man, that's the only juice in life. And I bet, like, I haven't thought about suicide anytime I'm sparked. Oh, never. Right. I have, I have a theory on suicide that uh, everyone that goes through with it, it, it's always after a sleepless cycle, <laughs> yeah. right? Like you don't you don't wake up in the morning. Go, okay, that's it. Great well, sleep. And Albert I'm Camus, fucking, right? Albert yeah. Camus. He's like the only serious question in life. He, he's had a couple of things. One is whether to live or die. But the other thing is, if you're going to consider suicide, it should be in the vein of, do I feel like a cup of coffee or not? Sure. Right. right like right. But if you, it's coming from way down there. So in my times, I'm like, okay. I've learned because I've been there three times now. I've learned. Okay, let me wait until maybe I'll still do it. <clears throat> right, but let me wait. Until, it's an option. It's but, an option. But let's make that decision from like a, a sensible After spot. I've had some sleep. Yeah, and, uh, sensible yeah. spot. And and hug my kids. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that was the last time for me that I was seriously thinking about it. 
uh, it was the kids that Actually, brought me out of it. It's no, 100%. I'm sorry. It's not hugging the kids. Yeah. It's when your kids hug you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's end on that. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Fuck, bro. that was incredible. F and rad shout outs this week to Kevin Lee Royce. Thanks for doing the show, man. Thanks for all the cool inventions over the years through Bukoda. Thank you to Boldface Lodge. I'm still glowing from that trip. And a big thank you to Mother Nature for finally bringing us some snow on the West Coast. Hey, if you want a chance to win a 1910 hoodie, tag two friends and 1910 in any F and Red post. Tag New Greens in any F and Red post, and we will send you a sample pack of the best organic green drink on the planet. Be sure to come back next week for more F and Red snowboarding presented by Skyview Campers and brought to you by F and Rad Productions.